let's get ready to RPG! 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 Hello, everybody. I'm I'm leaning back. I'm I'm chilling. I guess we better start the stream, huh? What's up, everybody? We were uh, I, sorry for the little late delay. We were, uh, we were d we debating in the nice last call Patreon Discord about uh, which game is more combat focused. Is it third edition D and D or fifth edition D and D? There was some disagreement, so I said, "Well, okay, well, let's 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 put it out. Let's put it out there to the polls, even though that it says nothing to do with tonight's stream." Uh, I myself uh, have an opinion here, but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna answer. Um. What is up, everybody? Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to Thursday night. Feeling pretty good, I, I think. Uh, you know, Tuesday was a very bittersweet day. Uh, you know, Bob and I today were just making plans for uh, for getting together here this weekend and Monday to to start taking down taking down the lights, taking down the mics, taking down the uh, the electronics, start boxing everything up, and. Uh, yeah, so that was pretty. That was pretty tough, but you know, uh, the show goes on, and of course, we're going to be bringing you more nights of last call coverage from here at uh, in the home studio. But also, of course, we are looking to set up ourselves up in exile, and probably maybe make a temporary sojourn in the basement of Mister Aaron Smith. So I think it'll be. I think it'll be okay. I think we'll. I think we'll. I think we'll live. But you know, it's exciting. I feel like in some ways. There's sort of a, uh, I don't know, a passing of the torch, a, a, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe this is going to be KOLC 3.0. You know, we sort of had our initial KOLC where we were very um, focused on Pathfinder 2 and we really were focused on our, our, our actual play. And then we sort of transitioned away from that into more uh, being a channel about my love for the entire hobby, not just one particular game. And that's sort of KLC 2.0. And now with us leaving the studio, at least for the time being, um, you know, there's been some other uh, sort of changes that are occurring within the uh, Patreon uh, that just make me feel like we're, we're maybe on the verge or the cusp of something um, of something new. So, yeah, anyways, um, it should be exciting times. All right. Uh, Let's say some hellos, and then we'll, we'll see what the results of this poll are, and then we'll we'll, we'll start giving. Don't worry, we'll get into tonight's topic. Don't worry. Uh, Jackal Torn Moons is here. What's up, Jackal? Nin, catching a stream. Nin, great to see you. Glad to see you. Awesome that you could be here. Grim Prism, another uh, another old face we have not seen in a while. Good to see. Good to see you. Matthew Keen as well. Oh, we got some, we got we got KOLC greatest hits here. Uh, KOLC uh, or Matthew rather. Matthew is saying that uh, they're doing milestone PF2, uh, milestone, exp assuming milestone leveling in PF2 seems to be working for us. Awesome. I mean, it's going to definitely be one of the themes of the night, which is does it work for you or not? Um, Nin says this is a hard pull, though. I, I had a similar amount of combat in my campaign in both systems. Beowulf, hello, hello, hello. Mr. Henry. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Mr. Henry, sporting his KOLC member badge, uh, we do. We should have a new emoji available to our KOLC members. Uh, it should have gone through. So good to see you here, Henry. Uh, Nathan, good to see you as well. London, hello, hello. KC, what is up? Uh, you thought it was 3E versus 4E, so ignore my 5E response. All right, fair enough. Um, Heavy Metal Mystic. Says that they uh, they used to do milestone, but they have been getting more into XP. So, oh yeah, we'll we'll talk about it. So, Heavy Metal Mystic, I'm 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 gonna I'm gonna reach out to you there, ask you to chime in when we get to that point. Um, five <laughs> E had more three E more had more combat rules, but five E feels so much light on rules for stuff that combat that isn't combat that I voted for five E. Fair enough. Uh yes, the Smith Dungeon. Roman, hello, hello, hello. Catazor, hello. Just ran a game of Dragon Bone for the community. Super late here in Europe, so I'll catch the VOD. Good night. Catazor, awesome. Love it. Uh, I mean, the Dragon Dragon Bone fever is sweeping through the Knights of the Last Call Patreon Discord. Seems like seems like we're having at least a game a day, honestly. 
Uh, so that's awesome. I'm glad you had fun. And I appreciate you doing that for our community. Um, <laughs> am, I saying, am I saying the channel is going to become more combat encoded? No, 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 not necessarily. Um, Amaya, also good to see you. We got a $10 super chat from our good friend, Mr. Damian Williams, uh, who we were just talking about uh, on Tuesday's stream as one of our longtime patrons who's actually been on our channel, gamed with us. Hey, Damian coming with $10 says, I don't think this is a binary. There are games that give XP based on session time, like Genesis, and those that give XP when bad things happen, like Cypher or Storypath. So you have a third narrative XP. Yes, I mean, I, I, I sort of, I completely agree with you, Damian, and we, and we will definitely talk about this. I think actually there's a couple of things to talk about. One is, um, you know, most people think about skill-based progression. They think about um, they think about uh, uh, level-based progression. They think about milestone-based XP. They think about, um, you know, traditional XP-based um, leveling. But the fact is there's actually a, a number of systems, and more importantly, there are a number of systems that sort of have a hybrid approach. And so sometimes um, it's, it's about finding the right approach that will create the game experience that you want and that your players enjoy. Sean, hello, hello. Sorrel as well. Grim asking how the Forbidden Lands game has been. It's been going really great uh, so far. Um, we we had a t we had a almost TPK in the second session. Um, three of the four people died. Um, you know, we, we kind of set it up. One of the reasons I picked Forbidden Lands is because I knew that the game system could handle people missing sessions here and there. And I, I, I don't think, I mean, I don't think we, I think we've had a player miss every session. So, but it's not always been the same player. So it's, it's been pretty cool in that regard. Um, but you know, it's, uh, we're still feeling it out. You know, we're only five sessions in, so, um, it's been fun. I, I've been enjoying it. Definitely takes some getting used to. I could see that there's some, uh, a learning curves for some of the players. Um, you know, one of the things that I find is that, when you're very used to, even even if you're an experienced role player, you have just a massive bias towards D and D, and you're just kind of used to certain things from D and D. And so, when you encounter a game system that is different from that, uh, you know, like a great example is, you know, you're if you're playing D and D and you're a fighter, you're you're used to being able to basically, you know, start with a shield and a sword and armor. But like Forbidden Lands, you don't really get to you kind of start with jack shit. So it could be really frustrating because you're like my character is a fighter. How do I, I could even take a talent that gives me an improvement for this thing that I can't even start the game with. So it could be a very strange sort of sensation. That's just one example where I, and I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I'm just saying it is a thing that happens. So, um, let's see. Okay. Kyle, good to see you. We just, we're just getting started. Damien rocking, <laughs> rocking the whiteboard emoji. <laughs> yes, that's our new, that's our new whiteboard emoji. I, I don't know if it'll stay. It's just one that I randomly picked out and just threw up on there. Uh, Paladin, great to see you. Happy you can catch it. Whiteboard. All right, I'm going to end this. Uh, co we got, we have over 40 votes, so I'm going to end it. And 71% of the people here, this is why I love this community. It's why I love you. 71% of the people here said that 3rd edition D&D was a more combat encoded game than 5th edition D&D, which again, only 30% of people said. And I got to be honest with you, I completely agree with those results. I'm not saying if you said 5th uh, edition, you're wrong, because I, I could see where you could you could get to that point. But I, I do think 3rd edition is actually a more combat encoded game. 5th uh, edition is such a loosely encoded game in general. Um, it's, it you know, I, I think the, the narrative that it's somehow... You know, the, the reason I bring this up, too, is because of the Brendan Lee Mulligan thing about D&D &D being combat focused. And I don't really feel like it is. I don't think it's particularly <laughs> focused on anything, to be honest with you. But the idea that third edition somehow handles other things differently than fifth edition. I mean, the skill system is the skill system. It doesn't really matter what, what we're talking about. Um, you know, you roll a die, you get a number, you beat the DC, you do it. You don't beat the DC, you don't do it. I mean, third edition D&D, &D, fourth edition D&D, &D, fifth edition D&D &D are all exactly the same in all three instances. Um, so, you yeah. uh, know. Mr. Torres says, uh, I related so much with your farewell stream because I uh, am also a photographer and try to create an RPG channel. <laughs> but I gave up the channel and was able to continue as a photographer. Okay, so we just traded lives. You know, we, you're, you're, my, alter, you're my alter reality, right? You're my multiversal counterpart. 
So hopefully it's going well for you. Uh, what kind of photography do you do? Like portrait, uh, family, headshots, weddings? Curious. Um, uh, so this term will get thrown around a lot tonight. Um, but uh, Beowulf says diegetic progression with end of year training and small amounts of XP bonus is the sweet spot. <laughs> AKA pen dragon. Hey, oh, squirrel hermit. Um, <laughs> do I think I reached KLC as a result of milestones or XP? It's a great question. Probably milestones, honestly. Um, London, on the topic of rewards, am I missing something or does Forge really not give you much to reward players with? Seems like the seems that the proceduralism really sets the stage for go get it yourself. Um uh, I don't know what you mean, London. Uh maybe rephrase your question. I don't think I understood it. Uh Resolute Rebellion. Hello from Nashville. I like your chicken. I like your chicken. And I like Paramore. Well, I used to like Paramore. I mean, I still love Paramore, but their last album was not good. Uh, <laughs> yes, this stream is a result of sh pointless shouting into the void. It's good stuff. What up, Satir? Satir tip $3. GBM PBP is at an absolute crazy climax right now. London deserves a superhero point once this is through. And the Ooh. game deserves a first look at some point equals D. Well, uh, so for those of you who don't know, Satir is talking about, because uh, there's a couple acronyms in there. Um, Satir is talking about our um, uh, play by post, which is one of the many areas where people in our community play games. Some people get together, they play RPGs on Foundry or or just even on like a Discord call. But some people use our chat channels and we even have bots that are designed to assist with this that allow people to play by post. So P PBP is play by post. And then uh, GBM is Girls by Moonlight. And uh, he's he's shouting out our friend London Matthews here, Mr. Uh, Mr. Lund, who uh, is running that girls by it sort of is the girls by moonlight uh, evangelist of our discord but and you'll have to tell me if this is true london um i, I think you know about girls by moonlight uh because of of us because of me because to, to to the point i was a kickstarter of girls by moonlight so um i do have there it is um i do have the book uh in pdf and and in this really cool looking cover uh so i am a fan of it uh i mean pretty much like all fortune in the dark streams so anyways but that's very nice of you satir to uh shout out your fellow player like that and a fellow patron like that um yeah it's really expensive i mean the fact of the matter though is kyle the truth of the matter is and look i, I say this as someone who has owned multi i, I i've owned lenses that have cost many thousands of dollars um i gotta be honest with you these iphones these pixels they take pretty damn good photos they really do and uh you know there's there's even apps that you can download you can download aftermarket camera apps that let you shoot raw and stuff on your camera it's pretty crazy um does 3e have the same things as touch like pathfinder 1 yes so in third edition Okay, in third edition D and D, you had your armor class, and your armor class was comprised of several factors. One of which was your armor bonus from your armor. One of which was your shield bonus from your shield, and another which was based off of your dexterity. Uh, and then you could have additional bonuses on top of that from magic and things like that. Your armor class also had what was called a touch AC, which was your armor class minus your armor and shield bonus. So it was only your dodge and magical deflection bonuses. But you also had your flat-footed AC, which was your AC normally, but without your dexterity or any dodge-based bonuses. And then, of course, there's the mythical, the magical, flat-footed touch AC, where you don't get anything from your armor, you don't get anything from your dodge or dexterity bonus. The only armor you get to keep is from a, like a deflection bonus, a sacred bonus, a profane bonus, uh, an insight bonus, a luck bonus, 
I think that's all of them, but I could be wrong. It's been a while. Uh, Jackal wants to know what EQ server I'm rolling. We were, we're still in the decide. The, there's, there's decisions that need to be made, Jackal, and the most important one that needs to be made is, are we going to play in a, uh, a time-locked progression server, or are we going to just play one that has all the expansions? So that, that remains to be seen. Um, Mr. Tor in fashion photography. Oh, very fancy. That's pretty crazy. Um, I, uh, I, you know, I never did any fashion. I mean, I did, I went to a couple of photography. I went to Whippy a bunch and I went to like ClickCon in Chicago a couple times. And I, I did like the, the, the photography, um, you know, they, they have like these photography, I don't know what to call them, seminars, not even seminars, like it's like an active shoot, you know, they have models and you go out usually with somebody who's like famous or semi-famous or like quasi-famous and uh, and then they kind of show you the thing and it's, it was pretty fun. I mean, I'm not a very fashionable person, so I felt a little weird telling some beautiful man in a wonderful suit or some gorgeous girl in this like crazy dress, like I'm trying to tell her or him how to pose. It was a little, I was like, I don't know shit. I'm not... I don't know. I don't know what looks good. Um, it's good stuff. Um, okay. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Of course. Uh, it's not even necessarily that I like the the the. I my my I haven't really I've read it like I've flipped through it. I haven't really deep dived into Girls by Moonlight, but fundamentally there is an element there of you know, the sort of teenage angst monster hearts component avatar ish, which I really liked. Um, Mundruid, hello. Been binging my VODs. Sweet. Love the content. Awesome. Love to see it. You forgot this was happening every Thursday. It happens. Um, all right. Um, what's up, K-Tube? Um, well, experience uh progression leveling up so we're gonna get into it so what i really want to do first um as we always do is answer this super chat from our good friend vin the self-confessed cynic uh who comes in with a, a ten dollar a super chat and says for ttrpgs single character xp slash levels for longer format campaigns sucks and you can't change my mind but it works if the game doesn't have levels. Group XP and milestones are the hotness. Yeah, and, and I think what, what Vin really gets at here, though, is there are so many different levers when we talk about how to progress characters and why we need to progress or do we need to progress. Um, that being said, uh, I mean, I guess to define what a longer format campaign is, but I think... It's about structuring the player's expectations around the game. And we'll, and we'll talk about what, what I mean by that. But thank you for that super chat. Um, let's, uh, let's head over to, uh, let's head over into it. So I guess, I guess we'll probably need this. Um, Okay. We've got our uh there we go. All right. Got our whiteboard out. Now we're cooking with gas. Um, all right. So, I, I mean, the first thing, uh, you know, when we talk about progression, um, so, I mean, we got, we have to talk about, you know, what, what is, what even is progression? Okay. And, you know, because in the real life, in the real world, you know, we, plug in my plug in my uh 
plug in my into us there. Um, because in the real world, we have to uh, we have to work very hard at what we're you know we have to work really hard at something. We have to train. We have to spend a lot of time and energy and effort to get better at something. Um, and so, the first thing to understand is that, in my personal opinion, um, progression is is a reward. Because fundamentally, many of the shows, many of the movies, many of the stuff that you have watched that you love, those characters do not meaningfully change over the course of a show or a season. We don't really see them, you know, uh, you know, they, they're, they may change, right? Uh, certainly there are maybe certain elements of their personality or their outlooks, but in terms of like them getting just better and better and better, it usually doesn't happen. You know, the character at the beginning, uh, Derek doesn't watch anime. This is actually true. This is actually true. And and that is a good counter to what I just said, because you are right that this idea of, of leveling up basically does happen in anime. But if we go outside of anime, and maybe this is a reason why so many people who seem to enjoy anime also seem to enjoy TTRPGs. Um, you know, if you look at Lord of the Rings, you know, I would say that Aragorn was a very competent fighter uh, you know, in terms of warrior at the beginning of the movie. And he was at the end of the movie. I don't think he was meaningfully better in any sort of capacity. I don't think he, you know, really got that much better. Um, and so the reason that per, the reason, so that's, that's books, that's movies. So you, cause you could play a TTRPG and you have great stories, great storytelling, right? Let me look at the thing that Brennan Lee Mulligan just said, right? Like, I don't need D&D &D for the combat rules, uh, or I only need D&D &D for the combat rules. I don't need it for anything else because that's what we do. Well, you could also argue I don't need a game system for rewards and progression. I My players are just here to purely experience the, you know, the story and, and the narrative and all this other stuff, right? And you could do that. And Damien, stealing my fucking thunder says STA is perfect for emulating progression based on TVs or movies. Numbers barely go anywhere all. It's just personal growth, just like the show. And I was going to say that, you know, you could have a game like a lot of the 2D20 games, all right, from Modiphius, things like Star Trek Adventures, things like Dune. And you know what? Your numbers may shift. Your numbers may change, but they don't really get better. They don't really go up. They don't really, you know, happen. Uh, they don't, like, you You don't start the thing as somebody who sucks and end the game as somebody who's amazing. In m these games, your progression is extremely slow. Now, the game still wants to highlight mechanically that your character might be experiencing differences and shifts and changes. And so, and we talked a little bit about this in the Dune stream, your character may start the game with, you know, a faith of 15, okay, and a power of eight, these are like ability scores, ranging from like five to 20. And as the campaign progresses, maybe your character loses their faith and becomes more obsessed with gaining power. And so it becomes eight and 15. But your, your character didn't really get, you know, you know, didn't level up. You, you just swapped one stat for another stat because in the narrative, that is what seemed appropriate, but your character didn't get more powerful. Um, they didn't get more, you know, elite. So fundamentally, we you don't need this, you know, uh, in in your game. The reason why we have progression in our games, and the reason why we have in our RPGs, and the reason why it's a reward, is because it's a game. Okay, <laughs> this is the game part. I know I know people like to forget this, but RP game. These are fundamentally at their basis games. And the one of the essential natures, I believe, this is one of the reasons why I, I sometimes question whether some things that define themselves as games or maybe not games or not. And I believe this. I really do believe this. Um, I think games, by and large, need to have a way to win. You need some way to look at 
the game that you are playing and say, did I do the right thing? Did I, am I, am I doing what I'm supposed to be doing in this game? And if the answer is, you know, yes, then in a game, you are rewarded. You were rewarded with more points, more victory points, more uh, meeples or more whatever. Um, so this concept of being rewarded and progressing as a result of rewarding is, is fundamentally, I think, one of the most important aspects of the game. Uh, you know, Jay, I, I completely agree with what Jay here says. He says, you may not win, but you can tell you're winning. And, and that's kind of exactly right because people say all the time, oh, RPGs aren't about winning. You can't win. You can't lose. Yeah, I kind of beg beg to differ. I think you you can, you know. Uh, I think you can, quote, unquote, lose, and you can kind of sort of, quote, win. And so for me, progression is really, really important because I believe at a fundamental level, now don't get me wrong, there are definitely people out there who really don't care about the game aspects of these games that we're playing. Um, and while I think that these are interesting games and very, uh, you know, uh, uh, good games, I think that the 2D20 games, which have very different version of leveling up. By the way, I should also add, I, I would add to this, um, Fate falls into the same category where you don't really level up. You don't really get more powerful. You don't really, you know, increase your character's abilities. You start the game with your stats, then they don't really change. And you have your, you know, uh, your aspects and your aspects may change, right? I might start the game with an aspect saying like, I'm, you know, as aspiring space pirate. And then later in the game, I've given up on my space pirate ways. And now my character is, you know, uh, noble star knight to Lord Zerus. And that's my new aspect. And that's not necessarily more powerful or whatever. I mean, yes, again, uh, there are in some situations, there, there can be some numerical increases. You can improve a, a, a skill or something like that. Um, I, I have played a lot of Fate. I'm saying that it is, by and large, it is not a game about leveling up. Uh, I mean, unless your Fate game is about maxing your stats out so that you can crush everybody, Maybe you and I are, are playing different fate games, I guess. Uh, my fate games have not played out like that. To be fair, I've also not really played a, uh, the longest fate game I think I've ever played is like 15 maybe sessions, 20 sessions. So, and that was a superhero RPG too. Um, but uh, fundamentally, I think that the, the reward in that game is is uh, more about, you know, changing which a character is. Um, Certain PBTA games can be like this too. But I think that at the end of the day, gaming is about winning and winning is about getting rewarded. And in RPGs, we call that, we, we do that through progression. So what does it mean to progress? Well, that is sort of the, the at the fundamental heart of what we need to kind of talk about here. And we need to talk about the, why these things happen and how does this translate into the game system? So. There's a lot of different axes to talk about here because, you know, we have level-based progression, which, you know, obviously is very uh, popular in our D20 games, D&D &D and the like, okay? We have skill-based systems where you don't have a level, your character improves by essentially getting their skills to higher levels. Um, and this is true for most of your basic role-playing games, your uh, Call of Cthulhu, that type of thing. It's also true mostly for, um, uh, you know, Dragon Bane, which everybody's very popular with right now. Uh, it's also true in a manner of speaking for, for Burning Wheel, Torchbearer, Mouse Guard, and I would also say it's true for Legend of the Five Rings 5th Edition. These games don't have level in the sense that we would think about in D20 or D&D. &D. Instead, your character is sort of defined by, you know, what, uh, you know, what skills and mechanics. Now, all of these are tied to 
the mechanics of the game. But there are other ways that your character could progress, okay? And one of them... is diegetic based. Now, some of this will tie back into other things, but the idea here is that your character isn't improving inside the context of the uh, mechanics of the game. I knew that didn't look right. Um, Diegetic. There we go. Okay. So what what does this mean? So diegetic based means that when your character goes and uh you know learns something or learns some you know goes and trains with somebody, your GM says, okay, you get better at that thing. It has nothing to do with a skill system. It has nothing to do with a level up. It has nothing to do with any of that. It just has to do with happening in the fiction, and your character gets better at that. Now. To the surprise of nobody, uh, this is pretty unpopular. That being said, there are some instances where this happens. Um, and Dragonbane actually is a great example of, of this. And this gets to kind of a, of a core idea, which is a lot of games okay, use a hybrid approach of these things, right? So there's a lot of games where you progress in some ways some in some ways uh, one way and in other ways you progress other you know in different ways um and we'll, we'll definitely get to this now when it comes so th this is one axis and we can continue to build onto this but there is another axis as well and that's like the question of okay like how how does this stuff okay how does level based how does skill based how does diegetic based progression how does that actually in occur and this is where we get to the question of things like, are we using XP? Are we using milestone? Okay. Is it, is it diegetic, right? You, it sounds crazy, but you could have diegetic level-based progression, which makes, makes crazy. Now, and we're not even talking about yet how you earn these milestones and how you earn this XP, because that's, an, that's a separate conversation, right, within it. So there's a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of really, really weird, crazy stuff here happening. So, um, but we have this idea of level-based, skill-based, uh, diegetic-based. So there's a lot of different ways that your character can, quote unquote, get better in the game. Um, it kind of, it's kind of a form of progression, but, uh, you know, it, oh, it, we talked about hybrid forms and I mentioned Dragonbane, but. Can anybody tell me what the most uh, what what was the most obvious diegetic based progression in the game? In chat, um, not it's not a system. I'll tell you that. I'll tell you this. It's in D and D. It's in Pathfinder. It's in pretty much you know. Uh, again, remember these are the these are the rewards themselves. You're getting more levels. You're getting skills. You're getting diegetic. This is this is the this is the how you earn those wars. Um, yes, Grim Prism, money. That is correct. Exactly. Loot, uh, 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 money, boons, but could be from like Pathfinder Two, where you get like you know the 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 bonuses from the gods and stuff like that. But yes, treasure, whether it's gold or magical items or whatever like that is a great example of diegetic based progression because you can point at it and you can say like it's real in the game. I mean, unless we're playing some really weird lit RPG RPG um, is that <laughs> most characters in our games don't have any concept of what a level is or what a skill ranking is. Again, I guess with the exception of anime, um, and so the idea that, you know, you don't level based rewards and skill based rewards are very esoteric, right? They're very mechanical. They're very, by definition, a meta reward because it doesn't really mean anything. You, characters in our campaigns very rarely talk about their level, right? Or my skill ranking, 
you know, it, it would be very weird to be in a, you know, I, I think we can all agree with that, right? It'd be very weird to be in a D and D game and being like, you know, well, my diplomacy is plus 15. And I'm saying this in character, like that doesn't mean anything, but in character, you could totally say, yeah, I, I received this flaming, you know, this flame tongue sword for, you know, my progression, you know, for, for, for vanquishing the, the demon dragon. Now, again, as I said, there are exceptions for all of them. And, and Jay, you are right to a certain extent. I, if people have always kind of played around with this idea, like, well, but shouldn't characters have some idea of what level is because there's things like, you know, mastering the arts of the second circle of spells. Sure. And, and there are some mechanical elements that tie back into levels, which really raises the question of what these even mean. And you are quite, quite right, Joe. Earth Dawn, and we've talked about Earth Dawn on this channel before. We've never done a deep dive, but one of the things I've said time and time against about Earth Dawn is Earth Dawn is probably, to my knowledge, the single greatest example of, uh, and it, the people in chat will help me out here because uh, it, it's the, the single, because I can't remember the exact term that we used to use for it. It's the single greatest example of a game where the game mechanics and the fictional world are synonymous okay like like gaining experience is like a thing in earth dawn and it's it's like and it's part of the world it's part of the lore and like your character is actually getting stronger because they're you're doing awesome and amazing stuff in fact the pa the pattern of the world is re-warping around you so that your character is stronger because you were doing cooler shit. It's really, it's really interesting. Um, and, and yeah, so it's, uh, it, yeah, it was purposely designed that way to kind of take the D and D tropes and make them in world things. Right. So earth dawn is anime. Let me just say this. Okay. Let me, let me just say this. Um, I do want to make sure. I do want to make sure I don't miss this. We had another super chat. I don't want to miss it. Sorry. Um, we had a <laughs> we had a super chat from Sean who said, "What's up?" <laughs> Thank you, Sean. <laughs> Looking forward to Origins, buddy. Um, and we also had a super chat from uh, Krellis or uh, Krellraz. Krellraz says, "Vertical progression by group milestone, horizontal progression individually by quests, temporary progression, i.e." Uh, inspiration by cool ideas and role play. That's an interesting idea. And we'll, we'll also talk about vertical progression and horizontal progression. And I think that that's an important thing to bring up. So thank you for bringing that up because you know, we'll, we'll, de we'll definitely start talking about numbers go burr. Um, and what does it mean uh, to have that? But that's an interesting way. And that's probably a lot. That's probably sort of the, the way that most modern games are designed and it's because of balance and we'll, we'll definitely get into that. So thank you, Krell Res, for that. And we'll talk about horizontal and vertical. Um, let's see here. We just had a $10 super chat from Henry. Skills exist in the fiction, just not in a quantifiable way. Comparatively, the characters probably know who is best at lockpicking, intimidation, crafting, etc. Yes, I think we can, you know, th those, those mechanics don't literally exist in a vacuum. Um, and, you know, uh, you know, there's, there's something to be said about Pathfinder 2 sort of defining the skill levels as trained, expert, master, legend. It gives you sort of a diegetic way to talk about your character's skill level. But the problem with a game like the problem, and the reason why I say it's kind of weird is because you could have a low level character uh, like a PC and they could train their whole lives um, and, you know, never actually become as good of a lock picker. Let me put it another way. In a game like Pathfinder 2, okay, you could have an NPC who is lower level and you, you can give them legendary lock picking, right? You can give them that to that. That's the thing that Pathfinder two lets you do. So you say they have a plus eight proficiency bonus from lock picking and thus they have a plus two or three from their level and a couple points from their stat. So they're, you know, lock picking bonus is plus 12. Then you take a level 20 fighter who's never picked a lock in his life. And he levels up and says, I don't know what I'm going to take. So he takes training with one of his skill improvements and he takes it in thievery. He takes it in lock picking. And suddenly that fighter is now better in the game than the master guild master of thieves, right? The, 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 of the thieves guild. 
And so it's a really weird because who, what would you say in the fiction? Who is the better thief, the better lock picker, the, the, the master of a thousand locks? You know, who's the lock picking lawyer? Is it the old man thieves guild master with legendary lock picking, but whose bonus is only plus 10? Or is it the high level fighter who just said, I don't even care about skills. I'm just going to take skill improvement thievery or skill training thievery. And suddenly they have a higher bonus. And this is where like some of that ideas can break down. Um, I do want to say something really quickly. So is Earth Dawn anime? Um, in Earth Dawn, in the fiction of the game, the way that your character gets better at things and the reason why it can happen so quickly, aka like, you know, you level up, you go overnight, is because your character uses the uh, experience. Experience points are a way of quantifying how important your character is and how how much they are shaping the world around them with their actions. You can almost think of it as a way of discussing how, to use a wheel of timeism, how Tavarin is your character becoming. But instead of Tavarin being something that you're either born or not born from Wheel of Time, Tavarin is something that you become in Earth Dawn. As your character does cooler and awesomer and more important things, the character becomes more important to the pattern. And you gain the ability, PCs have the ability, uh, that's why they're called adepts to rewrite their pattern. Okay. They literally, it's like the matrix. They like hack their own fictional pattern and make it so that they are a better swordsman or that they can now move faster or that they can now, you know, heal uh, themselves while they channel their energy into them. That, that isn't something that just happens for pretend it's literally a process by which the character is changing their pattern through magic. And uh, so, yeah, anyways, it is pretty anime, I guess, in that respect. Um, but it is very diegetic, so it works in, it works in there. Um, <laughs> let's see here. Um, numbers must go burr. That is very true. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, so let's let's really quickly let's let's talk really quick about these things just so we can kind of get this out of the way. So let's talk about level based. Let's talk about level based rewards. Remember, this isn't how you get the level. We're not talking about whether you get it from uh, XP or milestone. We're just talking about level based. So. For me, the the big the best example uh, the reason so the let's let's talk, let's talk about the, let's let's do this is this the pros what are the pros? Okay, it's simple, it's very easy. Um, they're straightforward. They're very accessible to new players. Um, you know, it's a very clear delineation between your character's next level and their next power up. Typically. It also sort of staggers the advancement, right? You don't want to overwhelm characters. I mean, I see this in games like, for example, Legend of the Five Rings. You get awarded XP every session, and you can spend the XP every session. In Forbidden Lands, you're awarded XP every session. You can spend the XP anytime you rest. So you actually can do it like in the middle of a session. If your character has six hours to take a rest action, they can spend their XP and become better at something. Um, that could be very difficult for some people. Level based is very, right? It's very all or nothing. And again, there are, of course, exceptions to this. Uh, 13th Age, for example, is level based, but has a, uh, a set of, I don't, I think it's optional. Maybe it's optional rule, but it, it's pretty prominent in the book where they allow you these uh, in-between level power-ups, right? So that instead of gaining all your power at once, you gain it over a couple of minor advancements. But in a traditional level-based system, okay, you don't gain anything. And by the way, I write this as a pro, but I could also write it <laughs> as a con, right? Which is, you know, all or nothing. Um, because I do think... You know, rewards are important for RPGs. And, you know, this is kind of getting a little bit into the uh, milestone versus XP question or dilemma. But, I and I understand that everybody's different. 
And I'm just saying in general. But I am saying that these are games, and we need to be aware of that. If you play uh, a game session of Dungeons and Dragons or some RPG, you play for four or five hours, you seem to do well, right? And at the end of it, you don't get anything. You don't get any sort of progression. Now, of course, as I said before, you know, there's other ways to level up. We're talking about level based here, but you could get diegetic based to progression. Your character may not have increased their strength. They may not have increased their attack bonus. They may have not gotten additional skills or hit points or hit dice, but they did get, you know, a, a, a new, a cool new magical sword. So there, there's a little bit of a reward there, but I do find that, and this is more of a modern day thing, the importance of magical items as a reward is drastically lower now than it ever has been in the game's history in the game's past. Magical items used to be what you were adventuring for. Now, magical items are just what you need to be able to go adventure. So instead of being viewed as a reward, they're more viewed as a requirement. And that, I mean, it, it may seem like a minor pedantic difference, but I'm telling you people, it makes a huge difference in the way that people respond to things. Most people nowadays, when they see a magical item, um, we're getting off topic here, but whatever, fuck it, it's my channel. Um, you know, the, 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 class, the classic example of this is that in the old days of D&D, &D, your character could find a magical item that might allow them to do something uh, incredible or amazing, or it could be something really stupid or silly. But either way, it was like you got this new thing that your character could never have gotten before. And so it felt like it was amazing. So when your character at low, you know, relatively low level, let's say your character goes in there and you find, this is the example we always use here, but let's say you find a magic trident, Okay, and it is a plus two magic trident that allows you to speak to aquatic creatures, basically making you Aquaman. Okay, now let's be clear. There was a time and a place where that would have been seen as amazing and awesome. Number one, it's a magical item. These are rare. The game doesn't, there's no, oh, I'm, I'm level four. I'm supposed to have a plus one striking weapon. If I don't have it, then the game doesn't work. We should use automatic bonus progression or we should use, you know, um, uh, automatic progression because eh, it just messes with the math if you don't get it, right? So getting that item was a legitimate power-up. Secondly, secondly, being able to speak to aquatic animals was seen as something awesome, right? Like that's not something that anybody else could do. The fact of the matter though is that if that same weapon were to be given today, two things would happen. Number one, its ability would be trivialized. Nobody would care about the ability to speak with animals and the ability to cast spells is so common and so you know frequent and scrolls and things like that are so everywhere that having that ability even if it was relevant wouldn't be seen as anything if anything it would be seen as a joke secondly most importantly your character goes well yeah but my my character's my character's built around this uh this high dex dual wield build and, you know, I've got a lot of feats invested in that. And my character is set up with high dex, low strength, and I'm really taking advantage of these weapons. The trident just doesn't fit into my character build. So what happens to it? I'll tell you what happens to it. Like every other cool item that doesn't exactly fit the PC's build pattern, it ends up getting sold for half. And I saw this happen so often in my the last Pathfinder 1 campaign I ran, which was called Dragon's Delve. Okay, again, I know we're way off topic here, but we're talking about progression and magical items are important. That what I did in Dragon's Delve, okay, I did a couple of things in Dragon's Delve because it, it, it was so important. It, the magical items as a diegetic reward had, and diegetic progression had been so killed off by everything that existed. I, I, I you know, this was PF1, by the way. Okay, so the first thing I did was I banned magic items, creation, feats. So characters could not create magic items uh, via, you know, taking a feat and then spending half, okay? 
So, because I didn't want a character to be able to just make whatever item they want at whatever time they wanted to. So that was number one. Number two, um, if you it basically, and let, let's, I'm not going to bullet point here, but basically the idea was if you want a cool magical item, okay, you need to get it from the dungeon. Now, that being said, gold is still of a treasure, and I still want people to be able to have that availability. So magic items could be bought. But uh, if you are familiar with uh, third edition D and D, hold on a sec. Third edition D and D magic item by settlement, then you are familiar, perhaps, with. I don't know if I was going to be able to find it really quick here. Um. There was, uh, I was going to look, for, see if I could find the, the table really quickly here. Um, oh, whoa, 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 wait, 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 maybe. No, damn. Um, come on. SRD. Come on, damn it. Anyways, um, sorry about that. But there, there was a table in the DMG, which basically said that like a small city, okay, had like D6 minor magic items and like D3 major, right? Um, and all right, now, now we got to find this because, uh, you know, this is just, this is just the way this, this stream is going. Um, how is everybody doing? <laughs> we're, 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 we are fully, we are well and fully having fun here. Um, Dungeon Masters. Yeah, it's one of those things where it's like, if you if you played the game, then then you know it. Now they change us a little bit in. Um, they changed us a little bit in Pathfinder 1. So that's why I kind of didn't want to do that. All right, here we go. Here I'm wilderness. Campaigns. Dangerous adventures. Where is this? All right, if somebody finds this for me, you will be my hero. Because that would be amazing. I don't think it was in character creation booklet. I don't know where it is. Um, now, generally speaking, I agree with this. Actually, actually, I kind of actually let me actually it it should be like this, but it should also be like um, it 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 should be awesome, or it should just be funny and silly and zany, like you know. It, it, the way that uh, D and D always worked was it was always kind of like there was kind of silly, funny, weird magic items, and I thought that was like a big part of the fun of the game. Um, page one thirty seven. Uh oh, did Hector do it? Uh, no, it, no, this is the cash. I need the. I need the magic item table generator. So the the problem with the 3.5 one, let me, maybe it's in the first, maybe it's in the other one here. Hold on a sec. 136. There is a very specific table that I'm looking for, and I don't know where it is. All right. Anyways, okay. Long story short, there was a table that said how many magic items were available. And so what I did was... I would roll on this, okay, and it would generate a bunch of items, and it was completely random. And by the way, this meant that the odds, and because I used, like, even the random, uh, even the items got put there, um, uh, that were put there, used the chance, percent chance of the item being an item, which meant that, like, long swords were very common, 
Whereas like, you know, spike chain was super rare um, because the, the odds that that would get randomly generated were really low. But here's the key thing. This then would be available in town. And I had like a market system where I would tell the PCs whether this item was high in demand or low in demand. And they could wait, and each time they came back to town, if it was high in demand, there was a chance that the item got sold. And if it was low in demand, there was a chance, there was a low chance that it got sold. And every time period that passed, if it didn't get sold, the item's cost would go down. So what ended up happening is because you couldn't make magic items, and because the random the magic items that were available were random, sometimes the PCs didn't look a gift horse in the mouth. If an item came up and it got cheap enough, they just bought it and made it work. Because they were like, well, this isn't what I wanted, but you know what? I'll, there is, I, my character totally used a sword, but Derek randomly rolled, and there's a plus three flaming, uh, flaming throwing mace. And I would normally never buy a plus three flaming throwing mace, but it's been out there for a couple of sessions. The price has dropped, and I want a plus three item, so I'm going to buy it. And so suddenly a character ends up using a plus three flaming you know, return, throwing, returning mace. And you're like, this is completely bizarro. And it, it created this world where the, the PCs were very, 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 ended up using a lot of weird stuff that you would just normally not see in a PF1 slash third edition type campaign. But I wasn't done yet because the third thing that I did is I created what I called relics, Okay. And these were items, magic items, found in the dungeon that were, quite frankly, stupid, okay? These are the items that your PCs would normally automatically sell for half, okay? Your characters wouldn't even think about keeping these. Instead, what relics did is they gave you a relic score and your character would add up your relic score. In other words, the more relics that your character had equipped, the higher your relic score was. And the higher your relic score is, you got a you got bonus XP at the end of every session. Uh, actually it was a multiplier times whatever experience points you had earned that session. Um, and as a result, uh, what this meant is some characters, who just wanted experience points and wanted to level up were ended up. And, and I would do this as sort of a, I don't want to say it's a troll. Okay. But like, um, you know, we can all think of some really stupid items that are in the DMG and, or, you know, various monster manuals. And normally the characters would just sell it. And I would basically say, Oh, but that is a relic. And it, it is, it is special to dragon's delve. And if basically they have to make a choice, they could sell it for half. That's totally fine. Or they could try to make this weird, dumb, silly item work. And if they could make it work and they were willing to just be flexible and incorporate it, quote unquote, into their you know character, then they got rewarded. And they got rewarded with bonus experience points. Because in my mind, they were, you know, uh, taking, taking a, an extra step to try to make the game interesting. And so between random magical items that were available between banning magical item creation feats, between uh, the fact that you couldn't just buy whatever items you wanted to do and that the items that were available were random and the items that were available that were random, if they were a stupid item, they my, 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 market, my market simulation, they wouldn't get bought, which meant that eventually the price would be so cheap, the PCs would buy them. So between that, that, and relics, you know, people, people had completely bizarro characters. And it was awesome. <laughs> I mean, characters had some of like some of the weirdest, coolest, wonkiest, you know, items that we ever had. Um, you know, one of uh, the wizard in our party ended up getting, again, it was all randomly rolled here. He ended up getting a wand, which we randomly rolled and determined it was an intelligent wand. Okay. That was named Hurricanus. And it was a gust of wind wand, something that would totally normally get sold, but it became a relic. 
And we thought it was really hilarious because, yes, it was a wand. This is third edition where wands had charges. No, you couldn't recharge wands because no one could have magic item feats. And, yes, it was intelligent. And, yes, if it got to zero charges, it was dead. And so this, this intelligent wand that cast gust of wind, but it had the ability to cast increasingly powerful gusts of wind. For each charge that the PCs used, the wind category would go up by one. So like strong gale to, you know, intense wind burst all the way up to like hurricane force winds. But it was also a relic bonus. So you didn't want to use it up too much because then the wand would be useless. Oh, completely unrelated to this really. Uh, I also banned cure light wounds wands <laughs> in this campaign. Um, so anyways, um, Point is, uh, I had to I had to go, I had to jump through a lot of fucking hoops in order to make magical items interesting and fun in a modern D20 game system. Because if you allow the PCs the otherwise the opportunity, I mean, we already have, players already have so much choice now where they can just pick whatever feat they want to pick. You know, back in third, a lot of people play third edition. It's like, uh, I, I could pick whatever class I want to pick. I, want, I can pick whatever um, prestige class I want to pick. Right. I can, you know, I can do whatever I want. Uh, I can, I'm going to get the magical items I want. I can buy them from town. Right. So it's, it's, it's a very different experience. And so I had to jump through a lot of hoops in order to get this. Um, what happened to the wand? Well, that is a story for another day. Uh, I will say the wand was very important in some, in some critical, critical moments throughout the course of that campaign. Um, okay. So, Level-based progression. It is simple. It is easy. It is all or nothing, which can make it a lot more digestible. Instead of having to deal with all these little nickel and dimes, you sort of get, you know, a lot all at once, and then you get a little bit of nothing. Additionally, and this is the, probably the most important part about it, and I've seen people mention this. Some of our Super Chats mention this. It's really great for balanced games because... If you've played a skill-based game, you know that it's difficult to look at a skill-based character and decide how powerful they are. It can be really tricky because it's not immediately apparent what their power level is. And when you're playing a game, role-playing games, for some people, the concept of balance and fairness is really important. Not just between the PCs, mind you, but between the game world and your PCs. For some people, it's really important that they know that this wraith that they're about to throw at their party, or maybe this pair of wraiths, or this pack of wraiths that they're going to throw at the party is not going to be a complete slaughter and they have no chance, nor is it going to be a complete cakewalk. They want to be able to understand, as a GM, what kind of challenge that is going to be. Now, of course, every game does a better job, some job games do better than this, some games do worse at this, but level, by and large, has become the sort of easiest way to determine how difficult something is relative to the PCs without having to actually sit down and break down each characters. In fact, one some people would argue that one of the failures, if you will, of third edition D&D, which was very much a level-based game, by the way, but because third edition D&D &D and Pathfinder 1, to a certain extent, had so much flexibility and car op differences between characters. A lot of people felt like the CR system didn't work because the level base didn't really matter. If you wanted to know how to challenge your party, you basically had to go and look at their stats. And the reason why I know that this is true is because not only did it happen in 3rd edition, but it happened to me in Pathfinder 2nd Edition when I ran several Northern Reaches games. Now, we ran our, now Northern Reaches was ostensibly a Pathfinder 2 campaign, but by the time I got involved with it, we had allowed so many different weird, cool, strange, magical abilities, diegetic progression, right, uh, narrative progression, that the characters no longer fit the mold of a traditional Pathfinder 2 character. And so when I wanted to figure out what AC the big bad boss dragon needed to be, Relying on the level was a fallacy. I needed to look at the PCs and understand what are we even working with here. So in that way, they weren't really level-based anymore. In fact, I would say that as you get more and more away from, you know, tight math, uh, the value of level-based progression actually, in my opinion, goes down somewhat. 
unless you are fine with the PCs getting stronger over time, meaning relative to their encounters, um, meaning a level five PC versus a CR five is a you know a tough cha- a tough fight, a worthy challenge. A level eighteen PC versus a CR eighteen, if is that a cakewalk, or should these two things be equivalent? So that's kind of one of the things that you have to decide. Um, Similar to this, uh, it allows for builds and planning. This is a big part of the game for a lot of people. Um, And it's one of the reasons why a lot of people like level-based progression. um, Because they can sit there and plot out what each level of their character is going to look at. Um, and that's really important for a lot of people. And the last pro that I'm going to put down here is now, yes, some people might even call this a con. I, you know what? That's a, it's a great caveat there, Jay. And the last thing I'm going to say here is numbers go burr. Right. The fact of the matter is, you know, for a lot of people, for many people, uh, D and D or TTRPGs in general are about this zero to hero fam, uh, fantasy, okay? And level-based progression is by far the single best way to encapsulate that. Now, in fact, there are some people who, right, I mean, 5th edition arguably has level-based progression, but it's it's not enough. Um, and so for some people, watching the numbers get higher is a big part of how they are how they feel rewarded. And even if you are playing in a game where the higher level the PC is, the monster just has higher armor class, has more hit points, right? You might say, so it, it really it really doesn't matter. Your character has 20 more points of attack bonus, but all the monsters have 20 more points of armor class. And for some people, that doesn't matter because what they can do is they can look back at their character from five levels ago or 10 levels ago and say, look, see how my character is stronger. See how my character is better. See how my character has bigger numbers. The fact that the challenges that you're fighting now are just as difficult as they've ever been, uh, doesn't really matter. What matters is being able to compare yourself with where you were. And to be able to see that. And it, and by the way, this isn't just an issue of progression. This is an issue of what I will call extreme progression, right? Where, uh, you know, Pathfinder 2 is probably the, is Path, Pathfinder 2 is probably the most extreme. Like, I will say, let me do it this way. Um, uh, Alt X, yeah, that's my eraser. Uh, we're going to go to a, we're going to go to a sidebar real quick here, over here. So like, You've got you've got power and you've got level, right? So like I would say that like uh first edition, okay, so this is like first edition A D and D is like, you know, as you gain as you gain levels, you get more powerful, and then it plateaus because eventually oops I Eventually, in first edition AD and D, you you really stop gaining benefits from gaining levels, right? And then I would say that uh, something like fourth edition D and D is more pronounced and goes up. But I would say, and I would say, by the way, fifth edition D and D is. less than 4th edition D&D, but I would say that Pathfinder 2 is the most extreme uh, uh, increase. Um, And this is simply because you get more benefits per level um, in Pathfinder 2 than you do in any of these other games. The best example of this is in Pathfinder 2, you get plus one to basically all of your roles, all of your stats, all of your things per level. In addition, you're going to gain um, proficiency increases. 
you're going to gain stat increases. And so when by the time you really do all the math, you've probably gained about plus two points per level. Now, I could tell you that in 4th edition D&D, um, it's about... Now, in 4th edition D&D, you, you only gain half your level, whereas in Pathfinder 2, you get one of your level. But in 4th edition D&D, I think it, it probably breaks down to about 1.25. Now, when you get down to 5th edition D&D, right, I mean, oh, geez, you probably only gain, what, you gain plus 4 from your proficiency, plus 2 or 3 from magical items, can you get plus five items in D and don't think you can. Uh, fifth edition and maybe plus three or something from stats. I don't. It, maybe plus ten over the whole course of the game. So is that like plus one half? Now, what I will say is this was very, 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 very uh, build dependent. But okay, PF one in theory should have been much less, but uh, in practice, you know, PF1 could, PF1 was kind of like this actually, right? It was like, it was like exponential <laughs> um, <laughs> because in PF1, everything stacked. And as you got higher level, you got more and more access to more and more spells and more and more items that just also stacked and everything stacked. And your character would just have the most insane, uh, you know, bonuses by the end of the game. <laughs> And, and Vin is just loving that PF1 just breaks. PF1 literally breaks breaks off the chart um, and just goes through the roof. Um, it's over 9,000. Um, so here, here's the thing. And you can see this in chat. I see people talking about this, right? You've got 5th you've got edition D&D &D right here with its bounded accuracy, right? It's a very narrow power increase, okay? Okay. Um, versus something like fourth edition or Pathfinder 2 or all the way up here, right, to our to our PF1. And you can see people reacting differently to this. You know, you see a lot of people saying they hate bounded accuracy. You see a lot of other people saying they like bounded accuracy. And really what this comes down to is how much do you want your numbers uh, to go burr? And level-based games are, are probably pretty good <laughs> for that, you know, numbering go burr. Um, so, uh, yes, yeah, so level-based games, again, a lot of the things that we wrote as pros could also be cons, but let's be very clear about something here. Number one, some people, uh, you know, level-based tends to uh, limit flexibility. Um, usually when you're level-based, uh, your character development is less flexible. Uh, you you, you kind of follow your set of progression. You can't really limp, you know, your character's kind of locked in. If something dramatic happens in your game, uh, well, it doesn't matter. It, your character doesn't change meaningfully, mechanically, until they gain a level. And so everything has to be fit into those level-based margins, right? And the ability to sort of you know, oh, I want to pick up a little bit of this skill. I want to pick up a little bit of that skill. Maybe I'll work on this a little bit and I'll, you know, add some magic to my character. It doesn't really work as well with uh, level-based progression. Third edition D&D &D and fifth edition D&D &D tried to sort of get the best of both worlds with their multi-class rules. And the multi-classing rules in fifth edition are very similar to the multi-classing rules from third edition. And I think we can all agree that that kind of is a failure because it just allowed for the most broken and egregious, uh, you know, types of characters and builds and exploitative things because it just didn't really work for that. Um, level based can also create, and this depends on the way you, re you reward things, but it can also create power disparities. Okay. This is a con. Now this may seem strange because you're like, why would the level base create power disparity? Well, because you're assuming that all the PCs are the same level. And in modern games where maybe level-based games or where level-based progression is really, really important and internal balance is really important to your game, then I would say that this is very true. On the other hand, if you are playing, let's say, 5th edition D&D &D, um, or even 1st edition AD&D where the power disparity between levels wasn't that significant, then you could play with a character that is a couple levels lower than you and it would be fine. 
Or let's take an example of a game which does not use levels, like Dragon Bane. In Dragon Bane, your character, after 20 sessions of play, could die, and you could make a new character. And there's no, you know, oh, so we, I get to start at the same level as everybody else? Nope, not, you, you, you basically make a brand new character, the same way that everybody else did 20 sessions ago. And you know what? You, you can play just fine with them. Sure, they might have uh, a couple more points in their skills, but you are going to be able to fight the same monsters that they're fighting. You're going to have the same relative hit points that they have. Uh, you know, they might be a little bit better, but not a lot bit better. And so level-based games tend to increase this power disparity because if the level matters, then it's going to create this issue of power disparity. Um, and lastly, and this is just me, um, it, it can make people focus on leveling. I know that sounds stupid, but, you know, it can take away from, you know, when I, when basically, what do you want to do? I just want to level up. I just want to level up, you know? All I want to do is level up. It, it can take people out of, it, it, it's almost, you know, you could argue that the pros and the cons here are very, very highly, you know, gamist. You know, gamist tropes here, right? Balance, we always talk about that. Whenever we talk about balance, we're talking about gamism. Building, planning, bigger numbers, um, right? Um, and, and focusing on leveling up, you know, focusing on winning. Because level-based games, more than any of the other games, tend to create a perception in your players, if I leveled up, then I won. And if I didn't level up, then I didn't win. And so that can create a very unhealthy and unnatural obsession with leveling. Um, and that can be kind of problematic. But if you don't have level-based progression, then it's very difficult to understand how or, you know, it's kind of like this, like, am I, am I winning? I don't, how can I judge if I'm winning or not? Um, and so it could just pull people out of, you know, uh, uh, of the, of the sort of the, the, the fiction. It can also slant people's uh, opinions and focus, but it does have the advantage of being, you know, very good for balancing games. It also, you could argue it's very good for breaking your games too. Um, but that is, that is level-based games. Now, D&D is the classic example of this, um, and, you know, um, Hyde says, Hyde says, in my Mega Dungeon game, I rely on them being obsessed, high, being obsessed with leveling. Okay, so Hyde his eyes is correct but incorrect, and it's going to take me onto a tangent. That I, It's a tangent. No, we're, we're back on the main topic, but this is now a new tangent from level-based, okay? Um, here... And this is this is my this is my gaming philosophy. Um, uh, the I just want to level up is what I hate most about level based progression. Okay, now high design. That's why I said you you you're right, but you might be wrong. Here, in my mind, is what the ideal motivation diagram looks like. Okay, and this is certainly for more of an old school game, right? Put yourself in the mindset, too, of somebody who's playing these games for the first time. It's the 1970s. It's the 1980s. We are just spoiled nowadays with video games, and we're so used to having all of this just, like, fantasy and magic and, you know, like, our, our, our entertainment has become so fantastic and so supernatural and so over the top. So we're playing a game, this game that, you know, called Dungeons and Dragons, right? And we've got our fighter, okay? And they have a sword. And we're killing orcs and it's really really cool. And we're exploring this dungeon and it's a, you know, it's a secret place underground and we're going in there and we're fighting monsters and we're finding treasure and it's really really awesome. And then we read on an ancient inscription on the wall that there is the lair or the, the legend, right? The lair of the, let's pick an appropriate monster here. Um, the lair, we'll go with the lair of the Hydra, okay? And supposedly in this, in this, uh, in this lair, in this 
place is a magical flaming sword. And we are just so cool. Like the idea of a character, you know, I'm not even thinking about the stats, okay? I'm just thinking about the idea of this being really cool, that this is a flaming sword. I want that. Not only that, I want to, f- I, w- I want to fight a Hydra. I've only grown up hearing about like, you know, the stories of Hercules or, or watching, you know, Jason and the Argonauts uh, as a kid. I, w- I want to fight a Hydra. I want to explore this strange place. Right. And the GM basically tells us, well, it's deeper down into the dungeon. And my character, me, Derek says, okay, what do I have to do? Because my goal is to explore the lair of the Hydra and it's to acquire this flaming sword. Me leveling up, okay, is a means to an end. Okay? Not an end unto itself. So this, I think, is the mindset that I ideally want to promote or push, especially in a dungeon-based campaign, which is I want characters to be excited about the fiction of the game, right? I want them to be excited about the cool monsters that they can fight and the, the magical items that they can find. And to be fair, when someone starts off new to the hobby, this is usually their default stance. I remember when I first started playing with Bob, Bob wanted to level up just so that he could go fight, you know, harder things. He was he was so excited about these cool monsters in the monster manual or in the bestiary. And he's like, what do I have to do to fight that? I just want to fight that thing, right? It's Bob, but his mind is in the right place. He's thinking about the game, uh, well, diegetically from a certain perspective, but he's thinking about it from a fiction first perspective. The level is just the way that he can get there, right? And get to it. Um, And so I think that that is what's really, really, really interesting. Um, And I feel like some people have it reversed, right? And that's when when the motivation cycle becomes bad. When the the motivation cycle is, man, it'd be cool to get lower levels so that we get even more experience points so that we can level up faster. When, when, When the leveling is the goal and the objective and the dungeon and the encounters and the adventure are just the way that you get that XP or the way that you get that next level. That's when I, I start to worry about how your players are perceiving reward cycles. And, uh, I start that to me, I, I see that as a problem. Not, not, not everybody sees like that's a problem, you know? Um, and you know, it's, it's, it is the, it is the, Unfortunate case that a lot of people become very obsessed with leveling up and that's the only thing that they want to do because they want to complete their build or, and it's like, well, why, what is it that you want to do with this character? And a lot of times the answer is, I don't know. I, I guess I just get to level 20. So that is why I, I sometimes worry about level-based gaming as it relates to mega dungeons and other things. All right. Um, so we talked about level based. What about what about skill based progression? Okay. Well, we've got highly customizable. Custom, I've customize, I've custom. Is that even a word? Custom, maybe there's another I in there. Um, highly customizable. Okay. Skill-based progression typically allows characters more granular control over their character development, right? You can build very specialized characters. You can build very well-rounded characters based off of your character's preferences, based off of your uh, character's experiences, right? And it doesn't have to necessarily wait until you level up, right? Beowulf says that skill-based games tend to have a higher level of verisimilitude. I would tend to agree. I think skill-based games can still be very gamist, but by and large, level-based games tend to be more gamist and skill-based games tend to be more simu. 
a little bit. Because the idea is, now, how we get these skill skill ups is very, very, you know, again, we're, we're, we're talking about the rewards themselves, not how we acquire them. Because let's be clear here, right? In some skill-based games, like, uh, let's say, Legend of the Five Rings, okay? In Legend of the Five Rings, or in Forbidden Lands, okay, you earn XP. And then you spend that XP to get skill ups. So there's a degree of verisimilitude here and degree of simulationist, but let's be very clear about ourselves. We may have never used a skill before and we could spend experience points to increase it uh, or acquire it or level it up. Let's contrast that with a game like Torchbearer. In Torchbearer, when you use a skill, okay, you mark whether you passed or failed. And once you have enough passes and enough fails, that's when you get the skill up. It doesn't matter. There's no XP involved. There's no, uh, there's no, I can't, if I want to get better at, I don't know, horse riding and torchbearer, I have to ride a bunch of horses and I have to pass and I have to fail checks um, because that's the only way that my character is going to get better. I can't just, you know, take, you know, take a, a, a experience points and buy a skill up. But generally speaking, skill-based games, um, you know, work, work that way. Um, let's see here. Uh, is chat out of sync or is it banned? Uh, I don't. I don't think so. I, I think I just read that. Um, Beowulf says skill based plus diegetic progression plus training equals chef's kiss. Uh, Self confessed cynic says is Call of Cthulhu skill based? Absolutely, Call of Cthulhu is skill based. Um, and some chats are on the screen. Oh, uh, oh, maybe 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 something's getting banned. I don't know. I can't say that. Um, love Call of Cthulhu. BRP is, uh, you know, a chef's kiss. Um, hey Carter, uh, chill buddy. Uh, you seem to be very, you seem to be very animated. This is obviously very important to you. I appreciate the passion, but just, just, just calm down a little bit. It's, 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 it'll be okay. It's fine. Uh, I promise you that, uh, you know, um, 5e is not, is not the, it's not the end of the world. 5e is fine. I did miss a couple super chats. Thank you. Doc Flamingo says leveling up is great in video games. <laughs> oh, I was like, oh, okay. Well, that's in, in video. Skill based is superior in tabletop because it puts the emphasis on what happening. Tabletop must play to its strength. Um, yeah, I mean, that is that is possible. Uh, that do I agree with that? Here's the thing. I don't think there's anything wrong with playing your TTRPG like of you know a game. It is a game. I will say, generally speaking, that skill-based games tend to tie more into the fiction, especially a game like Torchbearer, where literally in order to get better at a skill, you have to use it. And I do agree that tabletop in general should be, has, should have the advantage of playing to the fiction. And that is where skill-based, you know, games really gain their benefit. Uh, Damien with a $5 super chat says there are, these are the, talking about the people who go, these are the MMO players who grind to the end game in one day and then bitch that there's nothing to do. You know, it's strange. Um, but you know, it's, um, you know, it's, it's, it, it's, it's one of those things where it's just like, uh, some, for some people they get there and they're upset and for other people they get there and they are happy. They go, Oh, who I can, I can, you know, I can, I can end the game. You know, I I'm done. I beat the mission. All right. All right. Sorry, Carter. Um, sorry about that, buddy. Um, I mean, you know, you start throwing shade at my patrons. I mean, you're, you're, you're getting, you're getting booted. Um, anyways, um, <laughs> 
I don't like, hey, look, I don't like to censor people. I don't like to, you know, shut people out. But, you know, you know me. I, the number of people that have been, you know, kicked or banned on this channel is very, very, very low. Um, but, you know, that's, uh, that is what it is. Um, what is meant by skills here? Do Fabula Ultima skills count or is that still level based? Pepper, that is still level based. Okay. For example, you get skills, Pepper, in, uh, you know, third edition D&D. Um, where you get skill points, but it's tied to you leveling up. In a skill-based game, we don't really have levels. Um, instead, when we gain uh, points, we are putting them in to individual skills one at a time. Um, so, but, uh, so that's what we mean by skill-based. Fabio Ultima is definitely a level-based game. Um, right. Uh, yeah. It, it doesn't necessarily have to be skills. It's just anything, uh, that your character can customize and it's not tied to a, a level. Um, so it's highly customizable, very flexible. It can reduce the power gaps between characters because you don't have this like heavy weight of, of, you know, level hanging over your head. That being said, these are the pros. Um, it can also tie more into the fiction. You know, if your character wants to start getting, you know, if you're in the game, if your character has gone to the dwarven homelands and they have begun working and training with the dwarf masters, then the GM and you, I mean, you might start taking more points in craft because you're working with the, you know, the, the dwarven masters. Now, how you gain that, okay, is a matter of question. Is it based off of XP? Is it based off of pure diegetic progression? Right? That's an important question to ask. Like, I'll give you an example of quasi-diegetic narrative uh, progression, okay, which is Legend of the Five Rings. Now, I've talked about this before. In Legend of the Five Rings, the default way that you gain and so. In Legend of the Five Rings, you have your rings, which are like your, your attributes, right? Air, earth, fire, water. And then you have your skills. Now, these can be from one to five. And this is how many dice you roll when you roll these. Okay. A new ring costs three times the ring in XP. And a new skill costs two times the skill in XP. So in other words, if you want to go from a ring value of two to three, that's going to cost nine XP. And if you want to go from a skill of one to two, that's going to be four XP. All right. So that's how legend of the five rings works. All right. Now you get one XP per hour that you play. We'll, we'll talk about how this factors into progressional systems later. That's the default. So if you play for four hours, you get four XP. Now the game does have some rules and some, op, you know, I, I would, I wouldn't even say they're optional rules. They're more like sidebars where they talk about where if a character accomplishes, you know, a major milestone or has an incredibly important achievement, you might war, award them an additional XP. But the game also says that because in the in the game of Legend of the Five Rings, you have different types of scenes. There are conflict scenes, which are, you know, kind of more like, uh, you know, a fight, uh, a, a bitter political debate. It's a it's more of like a very short period of time. You have your narrative scenes, which is just where you're, you know, kind of exploring. You're still in character. You're still talking about everything. And then the game has downtime. Now, downtime could be like weeks or it could be months like your characters might it might be like okay the winter snows fall and your characters are stuck you know in Kyoto and Kakita for the winter what do you, what do you all do and the GM might say hey everybody gain 3 XP and spend it on some uh, a new technique or spend it on a new uh, skill and describe how 
the t- you use that time off to work on that. And the GM could just award XP because the group had time to sit around and get better at stuff. <laughs> so in that way, it's it's very this is hyper narrative, but this is hyper diegetic. Um, but it all still ultimately is not level based. It's tied into a skill based progression. Um, so the pros are that it's highly customizable. It can tie into the fiction and all this other stuff. Now cons, it can be more complex, right? Managing different spill progress, you know, skill progressions can be very, very complex, time consuming for players and GMs. It can slow down gameplay for all the reasons that leveling was good. Skill based, you know, you, you might be changing your character a lot more in a game like forbidden lands. You could technically spend experience points in the middle of the session. So that could be kind of weird and wonky and create certain problems. Um, it can be very hard to balance because in theory, you could have a character who put all of their points into swords. And then you have another character who put all of their points into lore. And you're like, what is a challenge for one of you is completely not a challenge for the other one of you. And you, you guys have very wildly, wildly different abilities. Um, you know, a game like Legend of the Five Rings is is so skill based that the game kind of suggests that you do this anyway. So I wasn't doing anything, you know, miraculous here. But I literally created NPCs that were Yojimbos. Like we had a character played by Kaz who was a, a courtier. He was a political character. But I didn't want him to have to like do nothing during a combat. But the fact of the matter, his his character didn't even carry a katana. Because to carry a katana in Legend of the Five Rings is to basically imply I am ready to use this. And he was not. Um, instead, his essentially his, you know, Yojimbo was his katana. And so the, he would basically play a separate character in combat than his courtier character, because his courtier character was completely useless. Um, and and but his, don't get me wrong, his his courtier character was one of the strongest characters in the party, just not in fights. And so you can see where I could say that this is, this is much more complex. This is much more, you know, about, you know, balance. Um, actually one of our favorite, one of our favorite things, this is just a quick little story. Um, so in the game that we were playing legend of the five rings, um, all of the, uh, all of the characters were sworn to a daimyo, of the Matsu family. Um, uh, Mats, Matsu might've been like Matsu Shota or something like that was his name. Shota. And uh, Kaz's character, our buddy Dan Kaz from uh, Quest for the Frozen Flame. He played Thrawn the Barbarian. His character was originally from, and this is the Lion Clan, by the way. His character was originally, he was born um, uh, Doji Hachi. He was born in a crane family, uh, and he was raised to be a political crane mastermind. As part of a peace treaty, he was married to the daimyo's niece. So he became Matsu Hachi, and uh, because you know he 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 joined their family as part of this kind of political offering, political maneuvering. So his character was. You know, I guess you could say uh, ethnically a crane, but he was in this lion family. And by the way, the crane and the lion are, are historical enemies. Anyways, he gets a character, and I literally just randomly generated this name out of Gary Gygax's extraordinary book of names. So he needed a Yojimbo. And uh, I should note that Bob also had a character, or also had a, uh, a, a special character. Bob's character was a Shugenja who are spellcasters, but they like speak to the spirits. It's almost unthinkable that a Shugenja would risk themselves in combat. So Bob's character, which was uh, Kitsu Hikari, he also had a Yojimbo. And Bob's Yojimbo was a fiery warrior samurai from the Lion Claim named uh, Matsusuka. She was a badass, but Kaz's Yojimbo, we rolled randomly on this name and it came up as Kazuki. And of course we abbreviated it or just called it Kaz. 
and we actually made it so that <laughs> and because because Kaz, our buddy Kaz, everybody just calls him Kaz. And so we're like, oh, say I was like Kazuki. I was like, is that his first name or his last name? And I said, oh, you know what? He doesn't have a last name. He's he's a Ronin. So his his Yojimbo was actually a Ronin, <laughs> which I, we which everybody thought was really, really awesome because his 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 bodyguard basically was like this kind of like uncouth Ronin who like, you know, kind of, you know, he 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 had friends in low places. Um, and so even though he was this NPC, it was actually really, really amazing. Anyways, you could see where this is a much more complex game than your typical D&D game, right? Where you've got two players, Kaz and Bob, um, to play two separate characters in their games. <laughs> Derek remembering all these names, and I can't even remember to eat. Yeah, it, it, I'm pretty okay with names. Um, it is, I mean, Legend of the Five Rings is a, is a challenging thing there. Um, so, again, the con is it can be complex, it can lead to uh, balance issues. Um, it's easy for a player to mess up slash car op, right? Because you have so much flexibility, um, you know, it, it's very easy for people to sort of, uh, you know, cherry pick and either make bad decisions or make really, really, really good decisions. So, you know, skill-based progressions, level-based progressions. Um, and I think that that is, that's pretty cool. Like, I think that, that, you know, those are sort of like the main things. And we talked about, at the beginning, we talked about diegetic progression, right? And diegetic progression, um, you know, we talked about treasure as being a form of diegetic progression. But let me give you another example of diegetic progression. I'll use Dragon Stealth as an example, which is, by the way, remember I said before, there's a lot of examples of level uh, of hybrid systems, okay? Um, in Dragon's Delve, um, thank you. In Dragon's Delve, uh, I don't exactly even remember what the encounter is, but my players, my PCs, were on like level one, and they like rescued this like it might have been it might have been a dryad i think that had been like imprisoned and was being used as like a magical battery or something like that anyways it was kind of like a it, it was kind of like a almost like a mini adventure within the dungeon and the group was sort of like you know trying to free this dryad they didn't really know that they were freeing the dryad but you know anyways long story short they rescue the dryad and the dryad was like, oh, you know, thank you so much. Um, you know, the, the blessings of the woodland are upon you. And um, each of the PCs who was there that day, okay, got an ability, which was called, uh, like, I think it was called, I think it was called bless, blessing of, blessing of the wild. And what it was, was one time per day they could cast cure moderate wounds as, as per the spell, right? They gained that ability because the dryad that was thankful for them freeing them and was obviously a very powerful dryad, right, bestowed upon them the blessing of the wild. Now, this is different from everything else that we've talked about so far because this isn't something you can look up in a book this isn't uh, another feat that you can pick, a skill that you can put a point into, a heroic ability out of the back of the book of Dragonbane. This is intimately tied to the events of that game. Something like this isn't something that any character can pick up. It had yet basically, you had to be there. And this ability not only um, creates a unique sense of reward because we'll talk about this when we start talking about milestone and XP and stuff like that. But one of the things that you, you need to worry about, uh, you, you, you can lose track of is, you know, if a character levels up, and they miss a couple sessions, but the group levels up. So they get to level up too. Again, this is all very subconscious, but it could be like, Hmm, me showing up doesn't influence what happens to my character. My character is 
only decided or what happens to my character is only, you know, uh, uh, what happens when we level with diegetic progression like this, it mattered that you were there that day. And because this isn't some part of some feat progression or skill progression or power progression, there's no way or reason why a, a player who joined later or how maybe they just missed that session, right? When they come back, they go, oh, sweet. Where's my cast cure moderate wounds once per day? And it's like, sorry, no. You know, you need to show up. And also it wouldn't even make sense. Your character wasn't there to receive the blessing from this dryad, nor did you help the dryad, nor did you do anything uh, uh, to, to, to gain her blessing. So this can be very powerful because the player will feel like this is their reward, not just the reward that the game gives them because they showed up. It's a, it's a unique reward specifically tied to their character, the actions that they took, the decisions that they made. So to me, in some ways, personally, this is the ultimate reward, okay? And, uh, you know, I, I think I can speak for Mr. Smith when I say that, you know, he feels uh, pretty, pretty similar. Um, I think that... Uh, This is, at the, this is at the core of what I want out of a TTRPG experience. I do not want the canned, you know, when people say, oh, Derek hates builds. No, I don't hate builds. Like when I used to play World of Warcraft, okay, uh, I would love figuring out what my talent tree was going to be for my rogue or for my priest. That was a lot of fun. But that isn't the experience that I want out of a TTRPG. I want a unique experience. It cannot be replicated by anyone else anywhere, unique to what happened in our game session. So diegetic, I mean, I can give you a many examples just from this one campaign of diegetic progression. Um, the most famous, the one that we always talked about is, okay, hold on a sec, Amea, this is, this is a perfect segue, okay? The, and if you're familiar with Northern Reaches uh, at all, you'll know this is something that Aaron and I love. And, you know, I love, you know, I love Wheel of Time as well. When they were playing uh, the Mega Dungeon, this is a side view, by the way, of the Mega Dungeon, right? So this is level one, this is level two, this is level three, this is level four, dot, 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 you know, level 10, dot, 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 level 20, right? There's all these different levels. There's even some sub levels, right? And all the levels are kind of tied to each other in different ways and, um, you know, this, this kind of stuff. Well, what they learned is they went through this campaign, campaign, mind you, is that the, there were certain locations within the, the dungeon itself that were linked together by m this magical portal network nexus that sort of lived under the surface of reality, okay? And this uh, surface, uh, this, uh, this place was called... Hey... I lost my, lost my mouse cursor. Interesting. Okay. Let me go out and back. Um, interesting. I don't know what happened to it. Um, okay. So these were called the Wendways. And the group gained the ability to enter the Wenways, but only using magical items or certain rituals. But they learned that there was a way to become a master of the Wendways. And then essentially, you could access this portal network at will. You didn't need any sort of special magical item or any sort of special uh, thing. This was Tim, Tim Carpenter from our channel. This was his like number one goal. All he wanted to do was become master of the Wenways. And you know what? Tim missed the session where they got to become master of the Wenways. And you know what? He didn't get to become a master of the Wenways. So I play, and, and, and he was disappointed. And that's a good thing because it means that, you know, it mattered. It mattered that he didn't show up that, 
for that moment. And you're absolutely right that this could leave a bad taste in someone's mouth, you know? It could have been work. It could have been anything. You're absolutely right. You're not wrong. And, and, and Nutromancer is saying, as a GM, I would probably make sure to give a missing player a chance to get their own power later. And this is the difference between you and I, Nutromancer. I did not, and I would not. And the reason is because that makes it not special. And, and I know it seems harsh and cruel, but this, is, you know, we talk, we were not, we're, we haven't gotten to the cons of diegetic progression, but they are there, okay? And, and the cons are, right, the cons are, the, the two biggest cons are it can feel unfair, grossly unfair, and probably the biggest one, insanely prone to breaking your campaign. And uh, if I've seen it once, I've seen it a hundred times. Uh, when you give diegetic rewards like this, it will inevitably uh, break your campaign. <laughs> it just happens. Um, now, what's interesting is I have a theory. If you look back at original D&D, Original D&D, your character basically got nothing. I mean, there were a couple of very special classes like the Paladin, which got some very limited special abilities. Um, you know, like Detect Evil and Smite Evil, and, you know, lay on hands once a day. But by and large, characters didn't really get anything. There were no feats. There were no skills. You got more hit points. And even after a while, you stopped getting more hit points. Um, and, uh, you know, your saves got better. So, I mean, it's not nothing. But by and large, you really didn't get anything cool or exciting. I believe that what people missed out, and what I think a lot of people did, I think lots of people did this, is they gave diegetic progression because the game didn't have anything else going on for it. Now, diegetic progression could mean magical items, which I do think that people did get awarded magical items. Uh, I always like to say that first edition characters, old school characters are more like Batman, right? They're wealthy people with you know, a bag full of tricks versus Superman, right? Where they themselves are just, super, I mean, don't get me wrong, Batman's well-trained. He's a, he's a pinnacle of, of his uh, species, but he's not a Superman, uh, whereas Superman is Superman. Um, but not just in magical items. I also think that many people would give these kind of diegetic rewards. And I mean, these are the type of things that we gave out in Northern Reaches, and it broke our Pathfinder 2 campaigns. Uh, and people really would, you know, you know break, they would, they would break the game. Uh, and it did. Because when you have a game system that is set up to reward characters and reward players just for leveling up and just for being there, but then you also want to layer on top of it cool, fun, in-game abilities and powers and cool special things that really tie to the day and the moment that happened, well, now, you know, it can, it, it can quickly spiral out of control. Um, and so it, it can, it, it tends to break your campaign. Now, maybe if you're really, really good at it or you're very sparingly with it, um, it might not. But I got to be honest with you, people. I have too much fun as a GM giving out these diegetic rewards. I can't, I can't stop myself. I, I, I just, I see something happening in my campaign and it's awesome and I want it, I want it, I want to remember it. And I want it to, I want to memorialize it. And I want it to be a part of what we're doing here. And I want it to be a mechanical thing, you know? Uh, $2 super chat from self convincing says, see above comment, the number matters. Uh, let's take a look. Um. Talk too much. Um, let's see here. Diegetic rewards can go too far, though, especially if there's already a lot going on in a system, e.g. when implementing them in something like F20 game. Okay, yeah, exactly what I just said. Um, yeah, 100%. Having a couple is awesome. Once you get their, once you get your 50th diegetic reward, uh, it's kind of meh. And um, I, I completely agree. I mean, you could definitely, I mean, this is true of anything, right? You could reward it into um, oblivion because to be clear, Anybody who anybody here in the channel, let me tell you something. You'd li you're lying to me. You're lying to yourself. I mean, when you're playing that, when you get your thirtieth feet, 
in your Pathfinder 2 campaign, tell me that it you don't actually care. I mean, you know what I mean? Or tell me that you care, right? <laughs> um, you don't. I mean, when you get rewarded with a bunch of anything, it becomes not that special. Um, and so that's 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 the deal. Um, I would never consider penalizing a PC for acting responsibly in real life. I'm not penalizing their PC. I'm simply not rewarding them. That there, there, there's a there's a slight difference. They don't need this ability. They don't have to have. They you know, again. In fact, if anything, this may sound crazy, but this is actually something I would do. If the group had been making their way down to the 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 you know the temple uh, or the shrine of Nibble of Seven Arches, so that they could take you know so that they could pass through the seventh arch and become masters of the Wenwei, and they had been working towards this for a while, and then the player Tim is like super hyped for this and goes, "Hey, uh, I I can't come on Friday." Uh, because of this important reason or because of this completely optional bullshit reason. If the player said, Hey fellas, can you, can we not, can we not go after this? Or if we're in the middle of it, maybe can we not play this week because I can't be there and uh, nibble N I B U L nibble Nutramancer. Take care. Enjoy your fake game. Um, yeah, so nibble, N-I-B-U-L. Anyways, I would be more inclined as a GM to be like, yeah, that's fine. We won't play this week. We'll we'll play some video games. We'll play a board game. We'll wait for Tim to be here so that he can be here. I am fine doing that. What I am not fine is playing and then pretending like he, he was there. But again, I'm, uh, I guess I'm weird like that. Um, <laughs> all right. So we've talked about diegetic, we talked about skill base, we've talked about level base. All right, so let's let's talk about how we even get this stuff. And this is like the biggest, this is like the biggest one. And I know it's already nine o'clock, but um we've got XP. Let me get let me get a bigger. We've got XP and we've got milestone. All right, this is great. This sucks. Good night, everybody. I will see you next time on Nights of Last Call. Um, no, uh, a little, hopefully a little bit more nuanced to it than that. But um, here, here's the, here's the, there, there's actually, it's actually very, it's actually very confusing. Um, so number one, these things are basically the same thing. Uh, XP is just a way to see partial progression. Um, whereas the milestone is basically all or none. Um, so because let's, let's look at something. And again, there's actually, there's actually, there is an exception to this where I say that these things are very equivalent. And I want to be very clear about this because if you play milestone based experience points or sorry, milestone based advancement progression, I think it's fine, but there is only one, there is one example that I will not abide to. Okay. When we have milestone-based experience or milestone-based leveling or milestone-based progression, there's a couple different flavors that it could come in, okay? The first is a defined a defined milestone. Okay, I should say a hard defined milestone. Okay, what do I mean by that? I have considered before the following. I have considered before making a mega dungeon, okay, with 
20 levels. Oh my gosh. With 20 levels, I gotta turn off. Turn off these auto shaves, they're killing me. Um, so these are the levels of the dungeon. You know, each one of these, this is a side view of the dungeon, right? So this is actually, you know, something like, ooh, this and this, and there's a branch over here and a room over there, and it comes back over here, right? So this is a side view, the profile view of the dungeon, as you're getting deeper and deeper into the dungeon. And I have considered before being like, you will level to whatever level of the dungeon you find. If you're on level one and your party finds the stairs that go down to level two and you head down to level two, then you get you go to level two. On the other hand, if you find this secret passage on level one that heads all the way down to level four, then you would become level four, right? I have, this is a hard to find milestone and it basically sets it up and the PCs understand what they need to do in order to gain levels. Now, the second flavor of milestone, which I think is fine, okay, is what I would call a, I will call it an ad hoc defined milestone. I am still fine with this. So in our milestone example, I basically said, hey, look, you know, whenever you guys go to the new level, you're that level. An ad hoc defined milestone is more like, you know, you're playing the game and a sandbox is emerging and the players learn that, uh, you know, the, the group of orc raiders has banded together and they're going to attack the town and that's going to be our next thing. And then as a GM, I tell the players, I define it for them. I say, hey, uh, you know, the players like, yeah, we need to save the time. And I was like, oh, that sounds awesome. If, you know, when you guys go and if you guys can go and save the town, everybody will get a level up. Okay, if you beat the big, bad, evil guy at the end of the adventure, everyone will get a level up. If you make it, you know, if you make it through the caves of darkness and get to the, the, the fertile valley beyond, everybody levels up or everybody gets a bunch of skill improvements. Okay, I'm okay with that. It's not my favorite. I'm still okay with it. Why? Because I am setting a goal for the players and they understand what they need to do in order to reach that goal. And when they get that goal, they know what the reward is going to be. There is a flavor of milestone based progression, which I cannot stand. Okay. And this is Fiat milestone. When the GM just says, Hey, everybody level up. I fucking hate that. I hate this. I hate this so much. I hate it so much. I think this is horrible. I mean, it's easy to say for my personal tastes, but I think this is horrible for everybody's game. And, and, and even if you don't realize it's horrible, um, it, it, it is. And the reason why is because you, you've, you've taken out the entire reward structure of your game. The players are no longer in control of their progression. They're no longer in charge of their leveling up. They're no longer in charge of their uh, 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 skill ups. Okay, they are you, they are basically just wandering around aimlessly, hopefully doing what the GM thinks that they're supposed to be doing, and then usually, probably because the adventure fucking says so, the GM just decides that they get to level up, or they say, "Well, it's been a couple of sessions." You know what? Everybody get a hard day. Everybody level up. I hate this so much because this to me just not even kills. Okay. Murders. Okay. The, the, the reward concept of the, the whole reason we're doing progression. You know, I, I absolutely cannot stand that at all. Now, Pepper says, but Derek, doesn't that mean they're just free to do whatever their characters would do instead of worrying about XP? Pepper. Yes. But if you're going to do that, then just say, hey, every two sessions, everybody levels up. Or every three sessions, everybody levels up. Now, I know what you're saying there's no, in there's no incentive here. You're right. Remember Legend of the Five Rings. I, I, I said we would get back to this. In Legend of the Five Rings, the default assumption of Legend of the Five Rings is that the way that you earn experience 
is that you get one XP per hour of being there, okay? If your group goes and you fight off a demon, you know, uh, sorry, an Oni army, and you save the empire of Rokugan, and it took you four hours, okay? And I'm talking dice rolls, characters getting killed. If it took four hours, you get four XP. On the other hand, if you talked in character about Ikibana, which is flower arrangement, for four hours, then you would get four XP. So why is this okay in Legend of the Five Rings? Because Legend of the Five Rings is a game that wants to reward you for talking about flower arrangement as much as it wants to reward you for fighting demon armies because it is not a game of heroic adventure. Legend of the Five Rings is a samurai life simulator and... Part of being a samurai is, I don't know, talking about your favorite geisha and talking about what you think about the, the newest, uh, you know, uh, uh, d- 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 laws that are being passed by the emperor, right? They're both worth four XP. But the key thing here is, as a player, you know that. You know that going into this session. You know that's going into this campaign. That if we could sit here and bullshit and get four XP... We could sit here and we could do, we could get into big, huge fights and fight duels to the death and we get four XP, but you still are empowered to know that what you're doing is going to get you a reward. When it is completely at the the fiat of the, of the GM, you have no idea what you're doing and, 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 and it, and it, and it robs you of the reward of getting it. Now, Heizazai says, I still feel like it should reward you for doing samurai stuff rather than just assume that that's what you're doing. I mean, at a certain point, Heizazai, I mean, if you're playing Legend of the Five Rings and you're, I mean, you know what, though? Here's the thing. If you're not doing samurai stuff, great. Then your honor is tanking. And maybe your lord uh, orders you to commit seppuku because you are ashamed to him and his house and your character refuses to commit seppuku and your lord banishes him and he becomes a ronin and then the lord sends assassins or ninjas after you to to try to, you know, I mean, it, it could still create a lot of problems for you in the game. Um, the, the, the story doesn't necessarily stop because you're not playing like a, a samurai. The game does reward you for being a samurai in other ways because there is a benefit to having a high honor score. But what the game doesn't care about is whether or not you can, you know, uh, uh, level up or not. Uh, Vin says, there is a cool gray area between ad hoc and fiat. I I disagree. I, I just disagree. I don't know. Um, I, I, yeah, hard to find would work. Well, I mean, here's the thing. Hard to find milestones. Uh you know, again, that's why I said, what's a hard to find milestone? Well, a hard to find milestone could be you get 40 XP per moderate. Now, sure, a milestone, we typically think of a milestone as being all or nothing, right? You go, basically, I mean, a milestone in Pathfinder 2 is the same thing as saying, here's a thousand XP. I'm giving it to you all at once. The the disadvantage from XP to milestone is just that if you play a session of Pathfinder two and you, you didn't achieve your milestone, then when you look at your character sheet, it doesn't look like anything changed. The numbers didn't get bigger and it could feel like you didn't get as much of a reward. Whereas when you get the experience points, it, there's more of a, of a tacit understanding that you're gaining it. But I, I think there's something important to note between XP and milestone which is, I still want to know what this, all right, hold on a sec, self Uh There's a cool gray area between ad hoc and fiat. There was one time when we had to walk through a particular door. It was ridiculous. I'm not sure how that, I'm not sure how that's a gray area between the two. The, the thing that I, the thing, the reason why I, I enjoy XP systems is because typically, especially with older games, The game sets out and says, you get XP 
for these behaviors. A, B, C, D. In D&D, originally, you got XP for getting gold and for killing monsters. And so the behavior, which was encouraged and rewarded, was getting gold and killing monsters. And actually, you got a lot more experience points from getting gold than you did from killing monsters. And so by and large, the focus was on getting gold. That is what this game rewarded. The, the, the control of the XP was in the player's hands, not the GM's. When we talked about this level where you, this, this hard to find milestone, where when you get to a new level, you level up, that puts the control of leveling in the player's hands. They get to decide how and when and where they want to level. And I really, really like that. When we start talking about even the ad hoc milestone, but especially the fiat milestone, the problem is it's no longer clear what is going to do to get us leveled. Like if the G, let's say we're playing on a Rise of the Rune Lords, and the GM says, "Oh, you know, if you defeat Nualia or Nualia, whatever her name is, uh, you you're gonna level up." And you're like, "Okay, that makes sense. You know, we'll go in there, we'll fight some goblins probably, and fight her 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 henchmen, and then we'll beat her, and then we'll we'll level up." And you're like, "Well, what happens? You know, you're playing the game, and what happens if the players get kind of sidetracked and they get caught up in that whole?" pseudo mafia thing that's happening in Sandpoint. I can't remember the Pulantes or something like that. Maybe I'm getting it wrong. Um, and they end up doing a bunch of other stuff and it's like, okay, well, are, are we getting rewarded for that too? And it's like the players have been told that if they go and fight Nualia, they'll get rewarded, but now they're doing something different and it, it can, it can create this really weird reward cycle where then you go, Oh, okay, well you guys fought enough of these things that you level up. And then it's like, okay, well, now we're going to go fight the boss of the other dungeon. You're like, oh, uh, well, now she's like under leveled. So I guess, I don't know, maybe it's fine. It's just, it's, it creates these really, really weird problems. I like experience because it lets me shape player behavior. Okay. The best example of this is in a game like Forbidden Lands. In Forbidden Lands, you get experience points. You get plus one for uh, exploring a new part of the map. You get an experience point, plus one, for defeating a terrible monster. You get plus one for a great treasure. You get plus one for building up your stronghold. So the game is telling the players what they need to do in order to gain experience, assuming that they want experience, which they probably do because that's the whole point of the game in a certain sense. Uh, that's going to, going to allow them to do the things that they want to do in the game, and it's a form of reward. That's why we're playing a game that has skill-based progression or level-based progression or any sort of progression. The game doesn't. The game didn't have to have progression. It could just be us with the same characters. They never change. But I want the characters to change, and I want to be able to control how the players are motivated for this. In this case, and there's also some additional XPs in Forbidden Lands, but by Forbidden Lands, is, I, it's doing the work for me. The reward system is going to create the kind of game that I want to have. It's why I picked Forbidden Lands. If I wanted a game about diplomatic intrigue or something different, I would pick very different XP triggers than what the game defaultly came in. But the game is set up as a game of, you know, raiders and warriors exploring a forbidden land filled with ancient treasures and terrible monsters that has been, you know, long lost. Great, cool. That sounds awesome to me. I'm glad that these XP triggers reward that behavior. Self-confessed cynic says, the gray area is specifically how is the ad hoc milestone decided upon and when? For example, I've decided at the start of a fight because it was extreme plus plus that if they somehow survived, they'd level. Uh, 
I, I mean, I guess I don't like that. I still like that less. I don't know. It, it, because it, it's still, it's, 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 it's a gift from the GM. I mean, all right, you told it to the players. Okay, that's fair enough. Uh, now, is, is this a fight that they are choosing to go fight? Or is this like as initiative is being rolled? Like they're in the fight, right? Like they, they have no real choice. They're just there, you know? Uh, I, I'm very torn on this. Um, the way our Forbidden Land GMs rules is that if we get XP for clearing an encounter, role-playing is just as valid as killing, really opens up the options. Amea, this brings up, an, uh, this brings up a similar thing. Dragonbane, which is also made by Free League, uh, also has a series of XP questions at the end of the session. And one of the questions is, did you overcome a challenge without using brute force or violence? If the answer is yes, everybody take an experience point. If the answer is no, don't take an experience point. So in Dragonbane, they have this specific question that is designed to promote the players to at least be thinking about solving things without brute force or violence, because if they don't do that thing, then they aren't going to get the most experience points that they can give. Uh, oh, the Sk Skazarni, Skazarni. Yes, you are right. Okay. I knew there was like a, a mafioso thing going on at Sandpoint. Um, consequently, they did actually survive. They did level and loved it. So let me get this straight. They're in the fight. Okay, they chose to fight it. But like, let me get this straight. So they chose to fight it. If they win, they level up. If they die, they're dead. I mean, isn't that the same thing as saying this creature is worth a lot of experience points? I, I mean, that that to me is, isn't that the same kind of, isn't that the same thing, basically? Um, Josh, I've been running a game that has both XP and skills. Players love getting both the slow drip from skills and the big rewards from spending XP. Um, that's well, again, that's pretty cool. Um, Dragon Bane sounds awful. I love violence. Well, Mark, good for good news for you. You also get an experience point if you kill a monster. So, <laughs> so <laughs> it's not the only way that you can get experience points. Ideally, uh, in a game, let's sell a cycle. Let me see if I can pull this up here. Uh, Dragon Bane <laughs> Woot. <laughs> Um, oh, wow. I cannot spell dragon bane. Oh. I think I have a personal thing, which is everybody who makes a PDF should have to like decide what like you can't, you can't make your PDF say DB underscore rule book. Come on. It's not the 1980s file names. Don't have to be 10 characters long. Just make it. Dragon Bane rulebook. Don't know no underscores. Just you know. I'm tired. I'm tired of this crap. All right, here we go. Uh, this is oh, oh, okay. This is Dragon Bane's XP question. Did you participate in the game session? You get one experience point. Did you explore a new location? You get one experience point. Did you defeat one or more dangerous adversaries? Experience point. Did you overcome an obstacle without using force? Experience point. And optional, did you give into your character's weakness? So assuming you're not using the optional rule, the way to min-max and get the biggest reward from a game of Dragon Bane is to show up and participate. Two, find and explore new locations. Three, defeat a dangerous adversary. Four, overcome an obstacle without using force. If you do all of those, four for four, you'll get the maximum amount of experience points, which is four. Um, so, uh, now, in Dragonbane, this game is telling your player, and it's telling you, the GM, this is what our game is about. Um, and you know, that to me is very powerful because this lets the players understand what is being asked of them. They, they can control their reward. And I think being able to control your reward to a certain extent is part of the fun. Um, 
And I know that not everybody agrees with that. But, uh, you know, for me, it's a, it's a big deal. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we talked about, um, you know, there, there are some, there are some potential downsides to XP. This gets back to what we were really, we were talking about leveling up. Now, don't get me wrong. I think getting XP is important. And I think that's cool because it puts the control in the player's hands, but it can make them it can make them make meta game decisions, right? It can lead them to say, "Well, I'm only doing this thing because it's going to give me XP." For some people, that is a problem. It's taking them out of the narrative. It's take it's you know it's not uh, encouraging you know them to be acting as their character would act. They're being artificially motivated to do these things. Now, granted, I think if you're playing a game that has any sort of progression, you're being artificially motivated. Um, but the idea that a GM could say, well, if I don't tell you what you could do to level up, then, you know, you won't be distracted and you won't be uh, uh, tempted by these other, you know, uh, XP options. And by the way, the classic example of this is, you know, this very, bru and, and I'll be, to be completely clear, D and D is, is, is known for this problem, right? It was like, you know, I get XP for killing monsters. Okay. Well, we need more, we need more, mon we need more XP to level up. I'm going to go, let's go kill some more orcs or ogres, right? That is why I have grown to really, really like XP things like dragon bane, right? Because notice, this, you get one experience point if you defeat a dangerous adversary, one or more. I I want to encourage that behavior, but I don't want to encourage like, all right, let's set up a let's let's set up like a like almost like a killing floor, like the way that they have for like livestock. But we'll use it with monsters. We'll just grind them out for experience, and then we'll like suck it up into us, like like we're playing Onimusha. Like no, like I, I don't want the game to become a mockery of itself just for the sheer pursuit of experience. This type of XP rewarding system is for me a much better example of this because it gets at the heart of what I'm trying to do with the XP system, which is essentially to create mini milestones, right? I want my players to find exciting treasure. I want my players to overcome dangerous adversaries. I want my players to explore the world. But think about as a GM, you could customize this in any game that you're playing. If you added or removed some of the, these XP triggers, in fact, imagine if, what if session zero, you as a group said, this is what we get experience points for. And you discussed it as a group. What do we what do we want to reward in this campaign? What do we want to reward in this system? How do we want to reward it? If you're playing with a group of like hyper murder hobos, maybe you're like, yeah, we you, we only get experience points for for uh, extreme encounters. You know, um, you could be playing with another group, and you might start with a list like this, and you say, I really want to add in there, like, um, you know, if we if we befriend a new NPC or forge an alliance, that's like, everyone's like, yeah, that's really cool. We love like kind of the politics game and it'd be cool to like do that. You know, uh, defeat a, you know, defeat a reoccurring a a nemesis, right? Not just like a dangerous adversary, but someone who has been, you know, a thorn in your side for at least a little while. You know, if that's something that you want to be part of your game, add it to those XP lists. And that way, as a group, the GM and the players are all basically kind of agreeing before the game officially begins. And this also is great because then when people go to make their characters in your game, which theoretically has mechanics, they know what is being rewarded and what isn't being rewarded. And if your group all decides that the only thing you're going to get experience for is killing monsters, um, uh, killing monsters, slaughtering monsters, slaughtering all monsters, um, kicking ass, taking names, knocking down doors, right? 
uh, getting sick loots. If that's what your group decides, then when somebody goes and makes a super diplomancer character, that's on them that their character can't contribute to what the group is trying to do. So I, I think that that is probably kind of like the best of both worlds is to sort of either start with a list and customize it or just, you know, cause I think that's a little bit easier than starting with just a blank list. Um, and you know, go from there. Like, okay, as an example, we didn't, we didn't exactly do this, but when we played Dragon's Delve, now we were playing Pathfinder one. Okay. So we were using experience points, but if you're familiar with Pathfinder one, um, there were three tracks of XP. There was slow, normal, and fast. And this is just to get to level two. Level two needed 3,000 experience points. Normal needed 2,000 experience points. And fast needed 1,000 experience points. This is to get to level two. And then it was, you know, it was different for level three and level four. But the idea was is that, you had one that was really slow, one that was normal, and one that was fast. And basically, 30 encounters, 20 encounters, 10 encounters. When I played Dragon's Delve, we used the slow experience. This was my Pathfinder 1 Mega Dungeon campaign. Now, why did I use the slow experience? Because I wanted to reward experience for three things. One, combat. It's a dungeon. We're playing a D20-based game. Absolutely. And in that case, they got the XP of the monsters. So in this way, it's no different, or the XP of the encounter, right? In this case, it is no different than pretty much any other Pathfinder 1 game, right? I mean, that's how all these APs worked. When, you know, you went through, you got experience points. You, you fought a C, you know, you fought an EL3, you got EL3 experience points. You fought four CR2s that were each worth 400 experience points or something. You got 1,200 experience points. So that was you know, divided amongst the party members. So that was totally normal. The difference is that most people, the APs especially, were using the fast experience point track. So after you fought eight or nine monsters uh, or eight or nine monstrous encounters, you would level up. But in my game, you didn't. If you wanted to level up strictly from combat, you were going to have to fight 30-something encounters, which is a lot. So... I also rewarded for exploration. And basically, each new room that they discovered was worth a CR equal to the level of the dungeon. So in other words, every new room that they discovered on level one gave them the experience points of beating a CR1 monster. And I also gave additional bonuses like CR plus one for finding like a secret door. What did this do? It meant that a group could just explore and level up just from exploring. They knew what the rewards were. This was not like some made up bullshit fiat. They knew that, you know, okay, we're on level one. A CR one is worth 300 experience points. Every room that we discover is worth 300 experience points. Did this make them want to explore every single room? Yes. But it also meant they're like, well, if we go down to level two, then all of the rooms we discover are going to be worth CR2 worth of experience points. And they're like, I kind of rather do that. And then the third thing I did was I put, mo I would take all the treasure from the monsters on the level and I would group them into several large hordes. So instead of 30 CR1 treasures scattered across level one, there might be five big piles of treasure. Now, these big piles of treasure were usually hidden or guarded, right? There was some sort of, of catch, and if you found it, you obviously got a huge diegetic reward, right? You got a bunch of gold, silver, maybe magic items, masterwork weapons. And, of course, that's on level one. Level two is, you know, three, four, much of the same. But a treasure hoard, and, and a lot of times the group would hear about this, a legend of, you know, 
the hoard, of, you know, the, the treasure hoard of the golden statue or the vault of Sarastique, they would hear about this. And I would kind of let them know, you know, in meta metagame knowledge, yeah, that's a CR4 hoard. If you find that treasure and acquire it and get it out of the dungeon, you are going to get the experience as if you had beaten a CR4 monster. And so it was entirely possible in my Dragon Stealth game to just find treasure and explore, and you could level up. But if you did end up fighting monsters, you got experience points for that too. There were different ways to gain experience. But the point is, you needed 3,000 to level. So the best way to do it was to kind of do all three. And that's what I wanted. I wanted the players to be, you know, not afraid of fighting and killing monsters. If it's d and I'm totally okay with that. But I wanted them also to want to explore rooms and feel rewarded for doing that. Not because there's a point. If you're only rewarding for combat, okay, then when the players open up the door to a room and there's no monster inside, right, you don't think about it. But it, what it, you're telling them is this room isn't worth anything. I hate that. Um, I want that I wanted them to feel just as rewarded for opening up the door to that room as they did, you know, to something else. All right. Um, so, and the same thing with the treasure hoard. Um, I wanted them to be able to find treasure hoards, and I wanted them to be smart. I wanted them to be a little bit, um, you know, uh, heisty about it, right? Like if the group. Like, you know, on very famously, like, you know, the group, there might have been a, you know, a CR5 treasure hoard on level one, but it was guarded by a, you know, maybe it's guarded by like a golem, right? Something that's way beyond what a level one party or a level two party could, you know, ever take on. But if the group was clever, maybe they come up with some crazy scheme to try to lure the golem away or they come up with some bull or maybe they just, you know, use sheer moxie and they try to like sneak past the golem. I don't know, whatever. They try to do something. Point is if they can get in and get that treasure and they don't have to fight the golem. Great. Take all the money, take all the gold, take all the magic items and get the experience points, right? Finding treasure to gain XP is something I'm kind of torn on. Shouldn't the gold be rewarded unto itself? Astral fury. I don't think you're, you are wrong. Uh, but, in my case, I really wanted to to double down on getting the horde, you know, to kind of really drive that to itself. But yes, you're not you're not you're not entirely wrong. Um, Five dollars from self confessed success. To be honest, what I'd really like to discuss is the hidden conversation happening here and a reason many folks use milestone, namely campaign and power pacing. It's a great question. Great point. Great point. Um. You're absolutely correct. Um, I mean, we talked about how people gain power. They get it through levels or they get it through skill. We've talked about X, like the, the method XP or milestone. But what is this really doing to your game? And as, as Vin was saying here, they use milestone because it allows for power pacing and campaign pacing. Absolutely. I mean, let's be let's be very let's be very clear about something here, okay? Milestone XP is almost required for running an AP. It just is. Or if you're running your game like an AP. It just it just is. Right? Um, and, uh, you know, you might disagree with that, but I mean, by and large, you're just going to have more difficulty with your game. If you use experience points, if you need the PCs to be a certain level. If if this is a if this is a consideration for you, then you know. Then if you need the PCs to be a certain level at a certain point in your campaign for whatever reason, uh, 
you know, you, you, milestone XP is going to make your life a lot easier because milestone XP, I mean, I mean, we, we've kind of talked about this before, right? I believe that discrete XP, AKA, you know, you earn it in chunks and the players know how they do it. That puts the power of pacing into the player's hands. So if milestone, if the players don't have the power of the pacing, well, that power had to go somewhere. So if you use a milestone, it puts the power of the pacing into the GM's hands. And the GM is just going to control essentially how, where, and why you level up. And in doing so, you have removed, in my personal opinion, you have removed level as a reward. Because now you are only going to level up when the GM needs you to level up because the math of the game needs you to level up. And unless you are one of those people or you have players who are just completely fine with the illusion of power that comes with these, you know, numbers and going burr. I, I, my, I, I would, I would not play in your campaign. I mean, that, that is basically how I would, I feel about it. Um, because it, uh, it would, it would feel pointless to me. Um, Uh, yeah, another similar consideration is I can't let my PCs get too strong. That's also exactly, you're completely correct. Um, because a lot of, for a lot of GMs, right, if the PCs are too strong, then the the cool, big, final boss encounter that they have planned or that the adventure path has laid out before them, it's going to be like, it's, it's going to be like a speed bump. They're just going to crush it and keep on going. And they're going to be like, oh, it didn't create that kind of dramatic, cool moment that I wanted. And so I need to make sure that the priority can't do that. Um, so now again, you know, Astro Fury, Astro uh, Furry <laughs> says, I can't let my PCs get too strong is something I very much disagree with. I agree. Um, in fact, some of my favorite moments um, in D and D again, I, I have a very warped sense of how I view the game. Um, I think success should breed more success. Um, I think that as characters and players uh, advance through the game, if the players make good decisions and they are rewarded over and over again, I am of the belief that the game probably, in my opinion, should get easier in a certain extent. In other words, the party should become uh, more or less challenged, not more challenged. Um, I don't think that level 15 needs to feel like level five or level three. Um, you know, I'm, I'm totally fine with the level 15 character being like that, you know, that lady in your office who's been there for 25 years. She is a master programmer. Nothing that is happening is challenging. She's just collecting her sick fat paycheck and waiting till she wants to retire. She's not challenged by anything and she's fine with that she is enjoying the fruits of her labor from putting in all the effort and you know learning when she was a nobody and an intern and not making any money i i think players should get that same thing i do not i do not buy into the whole like D D has to be a grind till 20 i don't like that in fact the original game was not a grind till 20 i mean it wasn't it, if you look at the monsters if you look at the math i mean players stop gaining hit points after level nine Loth, Demon Queen of Spiders, had 66 hit, 66 hit points. Not 666 hit points. Loth, Demon Queen of Spiders, had 66 hit points. She could be taken out with a single spell. Um, so, spider Matt, hello, hello, hello. Um, I personally love when my players, you know, do the things, get the experience, get a ton of uh, power in the game, if we're, especially if we're playing D20. I mean, God, if you're playing level-based experience, you're playing D20. If, if it's not for the power fantasy, what are you doing? And then they go and they fucking embarrass something. I, For me, that's awesome. I love that. Some people don't love that. Um, so, yeah, uh... Yeah, I mean, XP is coolest when there's kind of a push-pull mechanic to it, but now we're getting cut into the weeds. <laughs> um, 
Yeah. And, um, you know, again, I'm also very, you know, like uh, one of the things I like about Forbidden Lands is that, you know, it says you get an experience points for participating in a session. You don't get an experience point if you don't miss, you know, if you miss a session. Now, here's the problem. In modern D20 games, Pathfinder 2 in particular, the, yeah, the game kind of does break if the players aren't all the same level. I, I, I have learned this the hard way, and sometimes you got to just, you got to accept it. And the fact of the matter is in a game like Pathfinder 2, you kind of need all the players to be the same level. And so as much as I want, and, and that's part of the reason, you might say, oh, so, well, yeah, I, I'm not stupid. I know that the game has to works that way. Uh, but that is also part of the reason why I'm not running a Pathfinder 2 game right now, because that style of reward and that requirement of the game balance isn't something that I'm interested in. Whereas I could play Forbidden Lands and the players can get experience points for, uh, you know, accomplishing these milestones throughout the course of a session. And then a character could, could die, be reset, or a character could miss several sessions and not get any experience. And we might have a character who has 30 experience points and we might have a character who has five experience points. And yes, the 30 experience point character is stronger, but not, twice as strong, not 50% stronger, maybe maybe 5% stronger, 10% stronger at most. That other character isn't useless. In fact, they're, they could potentially start their character off and be more effective in certain skills and certain areas than the character with 30 or 40 or 50 XP. And I think that's really, really cool because it leads to the style of play that I like and it leads to the kind of reward that I like. And that's the number one lesson about all these progressions. I mean, people in chat brought up some really great points. Whether you're using Milestone or you're using XP, okay, understand that you're shaping the behavior. Whether you're playing a level-based game or a skill-based game, understand what it is that you're rewarding in the context of this game and use it to your advantage. Just The only thing I want you to be aware of is that it exists. And whether your players know it or not, whether they talk about it or they complain about it or bring it up, it is operating subtly under the surface. And all I'm saying is make the reward systems and make the progression systems work for you instead of working against you. You may not even realize that they're working against you, and they are. Try to align your style, your player's style, with the reward cycle. I mean, what we discussed kind of organically that kind of came out through conversations with you all, this idea of like creating the XP as a session zero, uh, what, what do you get experience for in this campaign? I think it's really, really interesting. You know, I think that's it. That's kind of an interesting idea, which I think is really, really cool. Um, I think it's great to see that kind of fight. Knowing the GM doesn't force a cinematic ending allows you to feel rewarded when it happens naturally. Um, yeah, I mean, I... I, I I completely agree um, <laughs> that uh, again, I, I get immediately turned off when like, you know, the game is just being like presented to me as something to be experienced. I, I, I just, I, I want to, I want, I want to be in control as a player. That's why I showed up to the game. Um, Yes, Kevin. I mean, yes, the idea is that once you got to level 10 or 11, your character was no longer out grinding and fighting demons and, Stuff like that. No, you were ruling a castle and attending small council meetings. And, you know, you were a, a high level priest and you were in charge of a religion or you were a king and you were worried about the neighboring border kingdoms, you know. Um, if I work my ass off to get enough XP to outperform the final fight, that's a badass feeling. Let me tell you about a campaign model, which I've discussed before. My patrons who've been around for a long time have heard me discuss this before. I just want to, I just want to, for those of you, we got a lot of, you know, we always got new people in here. Let me, let me bring this up. This is an idea that I had. I've never actually experienced this game. Okay. Here's the idea of the game. The idea of the game is, okay, uh, in one year, the level 25 monster will awaken and destroy, like, you know, the world or whatever, right? You have level one PCs. It's, it's day one. Go. You have one year 
to beat this thing. If you beat it in, if you guys, if you guys grind to level 17 in like a week and then say, yeah, let's try to go fight it and succeed. Great. You just beat the campaign. You won. You defeated, you defeated the ultimate boss. If you are so efficient and so playing that like, you're like, let's see how high a level we can get in one year. And maybe your group's really good and you don't have any deaths or you don't have any setbacks and you get to like level 35. Okay. Then you just, Oh, am I, am I going to make, am I going to make the, uh, am I going to make the G, you know, am I, am I going to make the monster level 40? Nope. The monster is going to be, I'm telling you at the beginning of the campaign, this is the monster. It's level 25. Uh, like a year in real life. No, I, I, I'm thinking like a year in game. In game. Um, I don't like the idea of a PC is gaining 17 levels in a year. That should take many years. This is something that a lot of people discuss. We didn't really get into this about the idea of like in character pacing. Levels make no sense anyways. They are a completely gamist idea and concept. I don't care if it took 15 years or 15 days. It doesn't make any sense that your character is that much more powerful. It is a gamist mechanic. It doesn't make any sense. So I don't care. That's my take on it. Um, Amea with their first super chat. Thank you. Ad hoc milestone reached. Amazing stream discussion. Let's get some guests. Oh, yes. Um, maybe we did we miss a super chat? Um, it's close enough. I'm not gonna. I'm not worried about it, Amaya. We'll say that. We'll say that your twenty dollars puts us over the edge. Um, but uh, yeah, I didn't even realize that we had gotten that many uh, super chats. That's awesome. Um, we'll definitely get some more people on here. That'll be awesome. That'll be fun to get some people on here. Um, so, anyways, I, I don't know if it's a year right or anything like that. But the idea is that you have one year to complete the campaign, and then you get you know go, you know, and the party. It's like, oh shit, okay. Like, and it's like, oh, yeah, you can totally, yeah, you could totally make magic items. You know, you could totally take as much downtime as you want. You could totally do whatever you want. I don't care if we get to year, you know, year one, day one, uh, year, year two, day one, you know, you lose the campaign. You just lose it. Um uh, according to 5e, you can hit level 20 in a month. I mean, I think uh I think no nat before he stop talking about Pathfinder 2. I think he was talking about that, like in his, most of his campaigns take place under like a couple of weeks, like in, in game time, like it might take them years or months and months and months of real life because they're just, you know, doing all this role playing and stuff like that. But like a lot of times these people are leveling up and like, yeah, in about a month. Um, anyways, I, I had this idea a long time ago and I was just like, I always thought it'd be interesting. And this is like a, you know, this is like a challenge, right? Like a throwdown. All right, all right. GM Scott made it official, official, official. GM Scott, thank you so much for that. Uh, thank you so much for that super chat. Um, getting, getting it, locking it down. Super, super official. Um, just get a bunch. You know what? You know what? If that happened, I, I would be fine with that too. Honestly, I really would. <laughs> like it would still be funny, and it would still be awesome because you know what the thing is. Honestly, and this is just me talking here. Oh. I clicked the wrong button. You know what? This is just me talking here, but like I don't really play D&D &D to be challenged anymore. You know, we talked we've talked before on this stream about like challenge mode versus like story mode. I'm not necessarily saying that I even want a story. All I want is, you know, memorable things. I've played in so many campaigns, people for so many years. Okay. I, I, you know, my, my tolerance for, for a, for a session being interesting or, you know, even to, even to make it, if to make it into the top 10% of my sessions that I've ever played is a very tall order. So for me, I would much rather have something that has never happened before. Even if it was insanely crazy and stupid, like recruiting a bunch of NPCs all, and then, and then, going on some mass binge crusade to get them all to be level one wizards so that they could all cast magic missile. And then you equip them all with level one magic missile wands and you bring your army of 100 wizards, which you trained and recruited and you call yourselves like the black tower. And then they all have their magic missile wands. And then you, you fight your way right uh, through the horde of, you know, 
monsters to get to the final boss. And then, you know, you're going to lose maybe, you know, 20% of them, 30% of them, but you just go, Brrr. I mean, I, I, that would be one of that, that would, that would breach the top 10%. If that happened, that would breach the top 10% for me. I would be like, that was an awesome campaign. I don't even care if it took, I don't know, a, a couple of months, it would be awesome. And I would be completely fine with that. I don't, I don't go into these games with this preconceived notion of what I need to have happen or what I want to have happen. I just want to be surprised by it. And I want to be, uh, I want to laugh about it. And I want to, you know, I want to, I want to experience some feeling that occurs because of this story and this narrative that is emerging before us, that is collaborative and that we built together. Um, Uh, Solana says, while beyond the witch, wild beyond the witchlight is like that. I think we've spent a few weeks in game and are level eight. Yeah. I mean, that, that definitely is, I mean, that's definitely how D and D is set up to play now. Well, especially it gets into like the pacing because the game needs you to be a certain level. I mean, old school D and D you might, it might take you weeks. I'm um, sorry. It might take you dozens of sessions to level, which is crazy, right? But now it's like, well, you need to level at the pace of the adventure. And the adventure is only so long. They can only put so many encounters in the adventure. So they only have room for like six or seven encounters per level. So that means that after one or two days of adventure, you need to be the next level higher in order to have it work with the math and have everything else worked out. Um, but yeah, so uh, I, I'm over the challenge part of play for the most part. Um, you know, if I, if I want to experience the challenge, I'll, I'll probably go play a board game or I'll play like a, a miniature war game. I, I want my games to, to create moments and I, you know, moments that I love. Um, sometimes they're operating within the rules and sometimes, you know, they're not. Um, and th either way it creates, it creates for, for memorable moments, you know, feelings, you know? Um, so yeah, so the key takeaway here is think about what your reward system and your progression system is encouraging in terms of the type of behavior that your players are going to experience and in the level of enjoyment uh, that they are going to, you know, going to have. Um, all right, well, it's almost 10 o'clock. So... Um, I don't know. Anybody, anybody have any interesting stories or questions or comments before we go? We got, we got eight minutes. We can kind of hang out here for a little bit. Um, Beowulf says it might be Pendragon influencing me. Gosh, I would never perish the thought, but I really like the idea that five sessions equals approximately one year. And it takes about five sessions to get the equivalent of about one level. Yeah, you know, uh, I, I I don't know. Uh, for me, I it's it's awesome that you tie. I mean, I get it. Like you, tie, you're tying the mechanics of leveling into this the the the, the pacing of the verisimilitude. I don't feel as strongly about it as you. That being said, you know there are I, I prefer for games that aren't about superpower fantasy to be longer duration. You know, I want, I don't play Pendragon, but I want my Pendragon game. I want my Legend of the Five Rings game to take place over years, not months or, you know, weeks. So I agree with you, I guess, in that way. $2 from the uh, self-confessed cynic. Pacing is so big, it's practically, yeah, oh yeah, we, we could spend five hours on pacing. Uh, maybe that's what we'll get. Maybe we'll get some people on, we could talk about pacing. I mean, pace, pacing is, 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 a, is a whole thing. And I mean, I will say this. By and large, the pacing of RPGs nowadays is blisteringly fast compared to what it was 20 years ago, compared to what it was 40 years ago, and certainly 50 years ago when this great hobby of ours uh, got its start. Um, people want more for doing less, and I don't blame them, right? We, we live busier lives, I suppose, than we do, and there's a lot more sources of distraction that you know are constantly pulling at our attention. Um, so maybe it's just a unfortunate consequence of the of the nature of the of the game uh thank you uh red chills i've been checking you out for a couple months oh well thank you uh and fi oh finally jumped on the patreon tonight love what we're doing well awesome thank you for the support 
Uh, it, 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 it's, a bit, it's a bit like jumping into the deep end, but if you're looking to talk about new RPGs, RPG ideas, get into stupid shit post uh, memes, uh, and play in a bunch of games that are going up all the time, you made the right choice. So fantastic. Thank you, Red Chills. Appreciate it. I look forward to talking to you uh, on the Patreon. Um, I'm happy that you could finally catch a stream as well. We're, uh, we're here every Tuesday and Thursday. Remember to like and subscribe. Uh, get it, click the bell to get notified. We always, well, we almost always go stream live Tuesdays and Thursdays, but sometimes I throw in a curveball um, and we'll, I'll stream on a random uh, uh, Saturday, Sundays, particularly uh, uh, impressive, uh, common. Um, are there any skill-based games that use milestones? Is it even possible? Well, uh, you could, I mean, I guess fate, um, like you could have it where like when you reach a milestone, the GM says, you know, you get five skills that you get to improve or you get to improve two skills. Um, so you could do that. Fate maybe kind of works like that, I guess. So maybe. Um, <laughs> what do you feel about XP levels, et cetera, in systems with like 10 levels versus 30 or 50? Um, do I feel any different? No, no, I, I don't think I feel any different. I know again, other people have a much different sense of pacing than I do. I don't particularly like, I don't think that 10 levels in a game, like, a, 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 you know, max levels 10, minimum starting levels one, it does not feel any different to me materially than a game that is one to 20 or one to 30. It doesn't. It really doesn't to me. Uh, I, I don't, I don't, I know, I know it's, I know it's different for oh, pretty much everybody else, but it is not any different to me. Um, especially if it's a standard D20 where it's like, okay, at, at level 10, level 20, whatever. when you're at max level, you're at max level and you're kind of crazy and gonzo compared to what you were when you started. To me, it doesn't really feel any different. So XP works just as fine there. Um, I will play Pendragon. It is in the bones, my friend. I, I, look, I mean, I played the solo game. Up when the, when the proper sixth edition comes out, I, I think I'm going to definitely pick it up. Uh, you had an experience relevant to your, this stream with your mega dungeon last night. All right. All right. We had a super chat. Roman, welcome. Regarding the one year idea, what system would you recommend for the level and recruit NPCs? However you can feel fifth edition D and D or third edition D and D basically not anything but fourth edition D and D and maybe not, uh, Pathfinder 2. Like when we were playing 5th edition D&D &D last the last time we played 5th edition D&D, &D, we played a pretty house ruled version of the game. But um I told the group uh the way that we were playing Caves of Chaos and so the group had the the the, the keep on the borderlands and that was like their long term duration. But then they would leave and they would set up a little camp. Chase, what up? We got tips, we got super chat. Chase tip three dollars. I started watching late at 2x speed and I caught up to live. Thanks for the great stream as always. All right. Well, so you did it smart because we're about to end, Chase. Thank you for the tip. And you get to watch it at two times two speed, so it actually moved along. So you you get you get the points and you caught in time to give the tip during the live stream. So you won. You won tonight, buddy. You won. Uh, but thank you for that, Chase. Um, but uh I would say that uh Pathfinder 2 and 4th edition don't really do a good job of it. But I was saying in 5th edition, they had this camp. And I told them there was a random chance that a red dragon, like a level 9 or 10 red dragon, they're level 1 or 2 characters, uh, could get, you know, could attack them. And it, I rolled it, and they were like, oh, shit. And they had, in their little camp, they had like 10 or 15, like, mercenaries that they had hired. And they had given them all short bows. And because it was 5th edition in the flat math, 
you know, 15 people with a long bow or 15 people with a short bow plus a couple of PCs was able to, to hit the dragon enough times and, you know, do enough damage. The dragon's not willing to die over some stupid thing. It's a dragon. So once the dragon lost 50% of its hip, 50% of its hit points, it left. And they, you know, they, they forced off the dragon with level one mercenaries with short bows. And I really liked that. That, that felt very cool to me. And I was like, that is not something that you would see in fourth edition or you would see in fifth edition. The only reason it's a little bit of an X factor here is because we're talking about magic missile, which technically doesn't rely on level. So that does throw like a little bit of a curve in there. But, um, but, uh, but thank you for the, uh, thank you for the tip chase. I appreciate it. Um, Damien, what do you think of games that will reward XP for negative consequences like GM intrusions in Cypher or taking a dramatic failure in uh, Chronicles of Darkness? Uh, another example of this is in Legend of the Five Rings. It's in a sidebar, so it's an optional rule. There is a rule called Twist of Fate. And basically, if if you use this optional rule, the thing is the GM is, can't lie about it because the players are going to know because they're going to get the extra experience points. Legend of the Five Rings has a similar idea uh, where if like, you know, the piece, if the GM wants to say that, you know, the villain gets away or that samurai that you thought you killed wasn't dead. Actually, you know, they, they, they fight this guy to the edge of the cliff. He looks down and he jumps into the ocean and the GM says, but this is a twist of fate and I'm awarding you all one experience point or two experience points. And, you know, they live, they, they were, they live to come back, but you have to be very upfront about it. And so Legend of the Five Rings does this. What do I think about games like this? As long as it is a known factor in advance, the players are okay with this, and that is a style of play that everybody wants to participate in. That they that is a that is a that is a very narrativist heavy mechanic, right? It is not simulationist. It'll bother the hell out of simulationist players. And it kind of makes the game part of the game not as important. Hey, I built this really great character so that I could beat this encounter. And now you're sort of saying you didn't beat the encounter because of my story. I guess I get experience points, but I don't care. I still feel like you stole something from me because I wanted to win and you didn't let me win. But if your group is on board with, we are here just for an awesome story. And if the actions that we took force you to have to bend the story and we get rewarded for that too, like I'm, it's a double win for me. Like if the, if the, if the person feels cheated out of their experience and you have to, you're bribing them with the experience points, it's probably a failure. So, uh, but I like those mechanics because again, we're all on the same page and we're here for the same things. Um, Josh, that's another thing. We didn't talk about this, but a uh, con, but you are absolutely correct. Going back to level-based experience points. One of the problems, I see this a lot in Pathfinder 2, where people look at their cool level three or level five character and they don't think they're cool because they're not level 15 yet and the build hasn't come online. And so even though they've got this really cool character in their mind, the game doesn't really start until they get to level 15 and they get the right magic items and the build comes online. And that is, that is actually uh, another problem with levels. That is a really good point. Um, my XP system rewards exploration and finding secrets. And last night, the players charged through smashing monsters and throwing their weight around. They did not get as much experience points in previous sessions. And that's fine because the players made that conscious decision. Sometimes the players will make the decision not to get the experience points because something else is more important or it matters. And that's okay too because at least they're making the conscious decision, which I think is really, really important. Um, when is the stream about pacing coming out? John, maybe, maybe, maybe next Thursday, who knows? Uh, you know, I, I, I don't have any vacations planned until origins in June. So, uh, you know, we should be here for at least, uh, at least two to three times a week, every week, but we do need to talk about pacing. Um, going to be doing a session zero of Fabula Ultima on your recommendation. Any advice for gamist nerds playing a narrativist game for the first time? Ooh, great question. Um, well, part of it is realizing, Astral, that when your character dies or your character is defeated, and this isn't really a session zero thing so much, but if your character is defeated and you choose to surrender, aka you don't die, um, the story goes on, something awesome happens narratively, but
but you get two fabula points, which is like two points of awesome, powerful narrative currency. So the, the way to, to car up, the way to beat the game, the way to be min-max is to play narratively. It's, it's the idea of turning the narrative element of the game into the game. Like when you're playing D&D, &D, if somebody wants to role play and come up with a bunch of shit, that's fine, but the game isn't rewarding you for that. In fact, in some cases, it could actually be hurting your chances of winning the game. And some people like that. But what I'm telling you is that a game like Fabula Ultima with its heavy-handed narrative as mechanics is turning the actual act of narrativizing things into the game. When you get to the beach scene or the campfire scene and you and another player talk heart to heart about what you hope for the future of your country that you're both from, normally in a game, you're just shooting the shit. And some gamist gamers might feel like this is a waste of time. But in Fabula Ultima, you are going to be able to establish a bond because of that. And that's going to give you, that means that when you spend a Fabula point, you're now going to get a plus two bonus or a plus three bonus instead of a plus one or a plus zero. So the, the key to, to playing the game is to do the narrativist thing. So that is, it's not necessarily a session zero advice, but it's more of just realizing that the whole point of that game is that by playing it and being a gamist nerd, you will generate stories. That's the key. Um, Oh, you're looking to go beyond D&D. &D. Well, Red Chills, you came to the right place. You definitely came to the right place. I finished my Abomination Vaults campaign yesterday. We could have gone to the level 12, but we agreed to cap it at level 11. GM still buffed the final fight a bit since it apparently expects you to be level 10. Well, my group played it. They were level 11, but we only had three PCs instead of four PCs, and they crushed it. <laughs> But, you know, but that fight is also kind of a narrative, kind of a narrativist fight because of the, the whole shard thing. So anyways. Um, let's see. <laughs> Kyle, you and I are practically incompatible all the damn time, man. And that's, that's the beauty of it. And you're both members of my Patreon that I, you know, like love to talk with. So that's great. Um, sweet. That's awesome, Hunter. Yeah, uh, my my, I, I, it was a fun, it was a fun, it was a fun campaign, and and I I actually told them, I mean, we 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 played through the entire uh, keep on the borderlands, like they went through the caves of chaos. I mean, obviously they didn't beat every single room, but you know they went, they fought the gnolls, they fought the owl bear, they fought the orcs, some of the hobgoblins, the ogre, uh, the minotaur, and then they went into the the shrine of chaos, the temple of chaos. It was fun. It was cool. I know, I know, I'm terrible. Um, next stream is Galaxies in Peril. Uh, we, we shall see. We shall see. Um, right. Bonds add to your group check. Like, if you want to beat Fabula Ultima, if you want to beat Max character, then you better really talk in character with your other party members and build up those bonds. Like, just like, you know, choosing, I don't know, Great Weapon Mastery or whatever it's called and Central Sentinel and whatever it's called from fifth edition. Um, you need to kind of, you need to role play <laughs> and build bonds between your characters because that's how you beat the game. So, um, and, and I enjoy those kind of mechanics. Some people don't actually, some people who you would think would love those kind of mechanics, like narrativist people actually don't like those mechanics because what they like is that they are acting in character and it's actually bad for the game, right? When the game rewards them for acting in a certain way, they feel like it cheapens the experience. Essentially, they, they it's almost like, you know, it's like, it's like kind of a mar it's kind of a martyr complex where they like, they're like, no, 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 no. My, the sacrifice has to be, meaningful and if and if if I'm rewarded for doing that then it just won't feel meaningful. Softball question. How do you determine how much XP to reward? In your experience, how often does the raw system get XP right? Wait, what do you mean? Like in general? 
Um, I, I don't know what you mean by that. Like for a specific thing, Vin? Or what? How do you run a sandbox in under six sessions? Make it a small sandbox. My players don't like long campaigns, which I think leads to linear sandbox. If they're interested in sandbox format, don't make it a large sandbox. Make your make it one town or one valley, or make it about one battle that takes place over the course of you know a week or a month or something like that. Make it about one you know discrete thing with you know two or three factions that are you know fighting for control of this river valley or something, you know, and then go from there, but just, and then, you know, and then when they're done with that sandbox, when they've resolved the conflicts to a certain degree, they don't have to necessarily beat all the bad guys, but when they do that, uh, then the campaign, you've come, you haven't come to the ending. You've come to an ending. And I think it is fine to end a campaign on an ending doesn't have to be like the penultimate ending. We killed God in space, but you know, we drove the gnolls out of the valley, but the humanoid settlers had to agree to let the orcs uh, establish a village on the far side of the river because that's what happened in our game. It was sandboxy and we ended up allying with the orcs and then they taught us about their primal magic and we actually found out they weren't so bad and, but the gnolls were bad and we teamed up and then we fought them off. Nobody knew that was coming. That wasn't part of some pre-written plan. It was just dice rolls and oracle tables and player actions. And the, the, the end of our story is the gnolls were driven off and the orcs and the humans now have a very tenuous alliance and they've agreed to, to split the valley between the two of them. Right. And that's it. That's the end of the, that's the end of our story. Maybe we tell another story. Maybe we don't, but we've gotten to a good point and, and then we can end there. And that might only take five or six sessions. Uh, Jackal has gotten up to a level five frog lock shaman. <laughs> shaman was my first uh, EverQuest character. It was a, was a barbarian shaman, but my first, my very first EverQuest character was a shaman. Love him. Uh, for example, how much do you reward for exploration if adding that into D and D or overcoming something through role playing? Oh, okay. Um, well, I suppose you have to establish it to a baseline of what is a monster worth, and then everything has to be in relation to monsters. And then also assuming that you're still going to reward experience points for fighting monsters and combat is going to be something that's still going to be happening in your campaign. What is the appetite for leveling up that you and your group have? If you and your group want to level up every other session, then the experience points have to be able to add up to that. If you if your group is ex expecting to level up every other session, and let's just say we're using Pathfinder 2 here, so it's 1,000, that means they need to earn roughly 500 experience points per session. If they go and explore a bunch of things and you know, do some role-playing things and you award them with 150 experience points for doing that, then they are going to go, okay, this isn't the way to get level every two sessions. Um, we either need to do something else or we need to add in something additional. On the other hand, if the group fights a couple monsters and they explore a couple areas and they role-play their way through a couple things or do whatever, and at the end of the session you go, everybody gets 550 experience points or 600 experience points. And the group goes, okay, we, we, we are hitting our, we're hitting our quota. We did this, we did that, we did this. It all added up and it gave us that. But ultimately the baseline for most of this stuff is combat. So you just need to decide what is this worth relative? I mean, what's a moderate encounter? 880 and a severe is 120. So the average encounter, right, of Pathfinder 2 is 100 experience points at level one. So if an encounter takes roughly an hour, 45 minutes, you know, uh, to of play to resolve a combat typically. So, and you're risking your life. So if role-playing is worth twice as much as that, then you are going to promote it. You might, you're not going to say, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't think it would completely eliminate combat from your game, but it's definitely going to be something that your players heavily consider. I think a good baseline is just making it be worth equivalent to what a, you know, average encounter would be, which is a hundred experience points. Um, uh, 
Let's see here. Right, you got an ending, not the ending, which is more fun. You got your ending. Exactly. Absolutely. You're 100% right. And I've said that before. The shitty, horrible, badly paced, poorly written, trope-filled, uh, uh, meme-filled, dumb, stupid story that you and I and our fellow players all built together collaboratively through our game actions is better than any adventure that has ever been written. Hands down. It cannot compete. Because the shitty, even if it's an awesome adventure, because the shitty story that we tell together is 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 just that much more meaningful. I will, I will, I will die on that hill. Um I love the shaman. You can, I mean, you'd have to really be, you'd really have to be jamming the uh, cannibalized to kill yourself, but you were absolutely right. Uh, are you saying that's too long of time or too short of time? Yeah, I'd rather have a bad story that we made together than a quote unquote great one that we just followed along on the rails for. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think it, you know, again, it comes down to what you're motivating and what you're, what you're trying to, uh, what you're trying to encourage. Like I said, in Dragon's Delve. I made it so that, uh, you know, exploring was worth as much as fighting a monster and uh, finding treasure was worth a lot. So that really incentivized the players to be smart and to look for treasure because I wanted treasure to have a premium uh, uh, of experience points and to be this really cool moment. And it was sort of also a callback to old school D&D &D where you got one experience point per gold piece value of the treasure, the jewels, the art, that you found. So that was all the other thing. Combat takes so long. So that's another thing too, just in terms of pacing. I am so over, uh, you know, I've been playing Pathfinder two for like, like three years straight, four years straight or something like that. I mean, uh, yeah, with breaks, I mean, so straight's pretty thing. but I, I mean, I, there's been a lot of Pathfinder two and boy, I got to tell you, I do not miss the, the combats being super long. We played our last Friday. We played our Forbidden Lands campaign. The group started off in the wilderness. They traveled along the river to an old mill that they had spotted but hadn't examined because they want to see if maybe it's uh, something they could take over and turn into sort of a fortress or a stronghold. So they traveled. They examined it. They looked at it. We interacted with it. There were some skill checks, stuff like that. And then they said, okay, well, let, let's, you know what, we'll, we'll deal with this another time. So they headed back up the river to this ferry that they knew about, but they had never been there. And they got there, they meet this family and this, you know, Halvard, who's the, the, the patri patriarch of the family, and they run a ferry over the river and they get there and they interact with them and they give them an, uh, a minotaur ax and they say, oh my God, this is worth so much money. And they heal up and they get provisioned and they talk with these people a little bit. Then they cross the river and they get information about other nearby things. Then they cross the river and then they travel north because they're looking for this ancient temple of the serpent. And then they're crossing through and then a griffin spies them, but they spot the griffin before the griffin spots them. And so now they're running and they're trying to hide from the griffin, but they're in this endless plane. So they get this idea. Let's take a bunch of our food. We'll lay it out there and we'll sort of back away. And maybe the druid can sort of talk to this griffin and kind of say, Hey, look, this is just for you. Just leave us alone. And they do that. And then they keep, then they get, then they get to the actual dungeon. Then they find a secret entrance to the dungeon. Then they enter the dungeon through the secret entrance. Then they climb up. They fight snake men. They steal a giant ruby from the mouth of a of a of a of a gigantic snake guarded statue. Then they break out. They run. They're being pursued by the cultists and the priests. Then the griffin gets randomly encountered again, and then it gives them like a like a salute, and then it attacks the the bad guys instead of them, and then they rush all the way. My point is, well, that all happened in about because we bullshit for a good solid like hour when we get together and we finished the night early. So that all of that happened in about two, two and a, two and hours, two and a half hours. I'm, I'm not even joking. Like that happened. Like we start playing at seven, but we really probably started staying playing at like eight and we were done by like 10, 10, 30, 10, 45. To me, that is so much more appealing than what did we, what, what did you do at your game session last night? Well, we like went into like two rooms and then we like fought like these two like weird creatures. I don't remember the name of them, but they had like tentacles or something. And then uh, I found like a 
I found like a potion of like gaseous form or something. And then uh, we went into another room. I think there was a trap. It did some damage. And then I, I made a bunch of treat wounds checks and we healed, everybody healed up. And that's, that's, that's where we called it for the night. Sorry. I'm sorry. If you, I mean, if you're jamming on that jam on it and I'm so happy that you're having fun playing role-playing games, but man, that is brutal. It's not for me. Um, all right. Uh, <laughs> Boothby. Uh, and again, I played the game. I played Pathfinder 2 for a long time, longer than I normally play any other game. I mean, uh, the channel, you know, kind of, I don't want to say it forced me, but I was playing a lot more, not because of Pathfinder 2, but I was just playing a lot more of one game system than I normally would ever do. I, I would normally never stick with a single game system for like three years, you know? Um, and yeah, listen, when I get the, when I get the fever, I love the grid based combat. I love tactical miniature combat. I mean, I, I want to, on the Patreon, I want to, I want to convince people that we should start playing D and D tactical minis game from back in the early, you know, mid, mid, mid early two thousands. Um, because I do enjoy that, but it's like, when I enjoy that, I enjoy that. And when I want role-playing games, I want role-playing games. Um, but yeah, you get, you get through a lot more when the combat is not long. That's for sure. How long are your typical sessions? Uh, officially, we play from 7 to midnight. But, like I said, we usually bullshit for a while. And uh, then, uh, you know, people get tired. We've had long weeks. It's Friday. You know, a bunch of my players like Smith and Bob have kids. So, you know, they might have an early day the next day, soccer practice or something. So I really try to end it by 11. So I would say we probably usually go from about, 7.30 to 11, 7.30 to 10, so somewhere in that neighborhood, you know, plus pizza breaks, and then if the wine gets busted out, you know, it can, you know, it can eat into some time. Some, And if we're talking about Night's Last Call, it can really, in nor northern reaches or something, we can really take it into it. Um, well, the other thing about, you know, combat is that, you know, original D&D, right, combat was mostly kind of like quasi-theater of the mind, but also had things like morale rules and uh, reaction rules, which meant that a lot of combats either didn't happen because the monsters weren't hostile, or uh, the monsters might, you know, run away and flee uh, after one or two members of their band get killed. Because, again, you know, that's how things really do happen in the real world, right? Like, if if you're fighting a, you know, a, an enemy force or gang or whatever, and you kill ten percent or twenty percent of their forces, the other eighty percent are probably going to GTFO and flee. So now we're forced. And by the way, once once you've taken out a couple of their members and you've got a, you know, twenty thirty percent advantage. I mean, you you were beating them when it was even. Now you're definitely beating them because they're down one or two guys. So now you're now the now you are a hundred percent basically to win. So there's not even any tension anymore. You're just going through the motions. It's pointless. You're just trying to see, I don't know, maybe, maybe one of them will get really, really lucky and maybe take one of you out. But even then, like if unless you're actually killed. What are you going to do after the fight? You're going to heal up the full. Like it, it doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter, you know. Um you forgot about the minis game? I did not. I love the minis game. I used to go to Gen Con to play I used to go to Gen Con and Origins and I would play in organized tournaments, you know, like for money, for prizes. Um I loved I loved the D&D minis game. I I really I would love to find like not everybody. A lot, we're a role playing game thing, but you know, there's we've played board games and stuff on our Patreon, and there's definitely a group of people in the Patreon who are really into the combat aspect of Fourth Edition, of Pathfinder Two, of D and D. And I'm like, oh, I think you guys would love the D and D minis game, and I think it'd be cool to like create like a league, right? Like a where you score points and we give prizes away. I'm 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 trying to figure out if there's a way to do it. I'd be excited to do it. Um, Pepper is playing Masks, Running FU, Interested in Wild Sea, Avatar Legends, Forge in the Dark Stuff, Forbidden Land, Dragon Bane, and probably more. Oh, hell hell yeah. Me too, Pepper. Um, Boothby's running three PF2 games and an Alien game and a Dune game and playing Traveler. But 
the best part, at least you're, you know what, at least you're playing Traveler because Boothby joined the Knights of Last Call so that he could play more games. <laughs> and he just ended up running a million of them. Um, I am not a 40K guy. I am a fantasy guy. I am super excited because the old world has come out. I've pretty much bought everything that has come out so far for the old world. I loved Warhammer Fantasy. When they, when they killed it off and they went to Age of Sigmar, I hated it. And I've been out. I think Age of Sigmar came out like 2016. So it's been almost a decade since there's been a proper rank and file, rank and flank Warhammer game. I'm so excited to play. I've been watching bat reps. Like I, I have like a bat rep going almost like at every hour of the day just because I've been binging it. Love it. Uh, 40K is okay. I like fantasy. Um, so, all right. Well, thanks everybody for hanging out. We had a really great stream tonight and I'm looking forward to setting up another, uh, multi-guest stream. And, uh, I, I think it'll be a lot of fun. Really, really, really love, uh, that everybody came out here tonight to talk. And I, uh, I definitely appreciate each and every one of you. If you're a member of the Patreon, thank you so much for your continued support. Um, you know, it's just incredible how much, uh, we've got going on. Um, and, uh, you know, the, 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 you know, I said this before, the uh, Patreon has really reached a, a critical mass, you know, for a very long time. And we've got some old, we've got some old hats here, you know, people like self-confessed cynic and GM Scott. We used to be about a hundred people, you know, uh, 80 people, 50 people. And, you know, half those people are lurkers. They don't really come online. So our community was only like 20 or 30 people. And it, it grew a little bit, obviously over time, but it, it was never self-sustaining, but now it is a big enough community and the people engaged are active enough that it, it sort of becomes self-feeding. And it, and it is a community of really high-quality players, and almost everybody's a GM, and everybody's running new games, and they're, they're interested in becoming better GMs. And so it's a very different community. Um, and, and I don't know what happened. It was really right around like the 350 mark, 375 mark. It, it, it suddenly felt like it just picked up this huge impetus. And now there's so many games going on, new games getting launched. I think, I think, I think it's going to be a really, really interesting year uh, for the Patreon. Um, and, and where I think a lot of people are going to get a lot of gaming in, which I'm really excited about, uh, astral. Thank you for stopping by tonight. Hope you enjoyed your time. I look forward to seeing you in the future. Uh, thank you. Amaya. appreciate it and appreciate the support. Looking forward to that pacing stream. Uh, yeah, I, I think it'll be interesting too. Maybe that'll be what we talk about. Um, uh, GM Scott says I'd play DDM. The fact that you called it DDM means that you are a real pro. Oh shit, this is still live. It is, it is, it is, it is. We, it took us a while and we've been kind of cleaning up for a long time. Um, it's because you joined. Oh yeah, maybe fine. Night finder when? Ugh. Please. Um, definitely need to play more games. Uh, absolutely, Trey. Um, looking forward to uh, some potentially, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm hopefully going to be running some games here as well for, uh, for tickets, um, of course, because I, I can't run games for everybody. But, um, yeah, I, I definitely, if you're not playing games, I mean, you know, it, it, a lot of people join the Patreon because they're like, oh, Derek is cool. Smith is funny. You know, Bob is great. But very quickly, they realize that, like, the community is actually the really thing that you're, you're signing up for. And you're, you're going to meet a lot of great people. So, Trey, if you're interested, I mean, there's a lot of games going on there, buddy. Gym night when? I mean, to be fair, it's it's quite the flex because I'll be like, hey, Gym night episode two. I'm 55 pounds lighter. Uh, so been crushing it. It's like, oh, Derek, have you been lifting? No, <laughs> no, I've barely been lifting. I really need to do that. <laughs> uh, oh, you heard me call it DDM. Well, at least you're honest. Um, the problem with Night Finder is the problem with Night Finder is. Uh, Pathfinder 2 is really good at what it does, so I don't know that there's a point in trying to fix it. So, um, I mean, there's things I would change, but it would probably just, you know, break it out. You know, it would just break the game. Um, yeah, exactly. I feel like it wouldn't be PF2E. Yeah, Night Finder at this point would not be even a Pathfinder 2 game. Correct. It would it would be a new system. That that is more probably the that is probably more the case. Uh, PF2 is perfect confirmed. I mean, we, I still have to read. I still, I still have to see what happens with core two. Um, but, uh, you know, it remains to be seen. Beowulf says dungeon time extreme would be better. Technically Smith created dungeon time extreme. Uh, 
Smith did create a Dungeon Time Extreme game uh, with, you know, with rules and, uh, you know. But it was, you know, it was a, uh, it was, it was a beta copy, and uh, there were some things about it that weren't fully f- realized or fleshed out. Again, it was just supposed to be something we were supposed to beat up, and then everybody got so obsessed with MCDM and Dagger. Like we were like, oh, and then like, but then Fifth Edition's like, we're coming out with a new edition, and MCDM was like, we're coming out with a new edition, and everybody was like, coming out with a new edition. We we're like, man, this is just a bad time to be like talking about you know, something that we did anyways. Um, no core two is not yet out. I know it is wild. It is wild. It is wild. Uh, he just released a video today talking about updates to their game, which they're still plugging away at. So, you know, the, the, the memory is short. <laughs> all right, everybody. Uh, thank you to all of you who showed up tonight. Like, like true heroes. Uh, thank you, Vin for, all of the super chats. Thank you, Chase, Roman, GM Scott, um, Amea. Thank you, Damian Williams, Doc Flamingo, Henry, Krellez, Sean, and Satir. And uh, thank you to Damian again. And thank you again to all of you who who hung out and uh, played a uh, played a role in the, in tonight's stream. It's not just about the tips. It's also about the communication. It's about the chat. It's about the questions. Those are very valuable to me as well. Um, and, uh, I, I, I definitely appreciate you being here. All right. That is going to wrap it up. I don't know if there's going to be a Sunday stream this week because I'm a little tired and I need to like start tearing down my studio, um, which is really great. Uh, so look forward to seeing you all next time on nights of last call. Good night, everybody. Peace.